I just Ooh, look at that new toolbox back there. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I am back in the saddle, and today you already know, you already saw the title. We are joined once again with our friend from the southeast, the one that everybody knows is their favorite redneck. And I, I don't think I've ever asked you how you got that name. We'll have to talk about that. Uh, Hubert Roland from Nitro Circus and many other ventures that we'll talk about today. Um, back in the saddle with me. How you doing, buddy? Uh, all's going great. I'm here at Pastrana Land. I just flew here yesterday. From Mid America and Oklahoma. Yeah, you just had uh, you just posted a video of you guys like rallying a rock truck through Mid America. What's going on down there? Uh, we have a, a wide range of things going on. Um, Travis has had a a vision of a rally cross track for many many years. Uh, we have many variations of it between napkins to a full out digital, you know, build thing off of a computer and all that kind of stuff. Originally, it was going to get built in Maryland. Uh, cards didn't work out, so they just continued racing, and then they met Jason Robinette. Um, that's through Terry Madden. He's been good buddies with them. He brought him up, showed him the park, and Jason just in short said, yeah, we want to do awesome things here and grow this into an amazing facility. Uh, so what do you got? Travis pitched his idea, and Jason said, yeah, let's build it. That's crazy. Uh, and Mid America is kind of cool because it's in a little valley uh, as far as the race course goes. And so you could do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I could imagine with with berms and, and, and sweeps and jumps and all sorts of stuff. Um, but uh, let's get into uh, kind of where we it's it's been over a year, I think, since we've talked last. Um, and I think you were prepping for a couple big events, including a cross country trip and King of Hammers. Um, let's talk a little bit about your cross country trip. That was a big event. I, I was trying to get it situated where I can meet up with you while you were here in the Northwest, but didn't work out on my end. That was totally my fault. Um, but, uh, you drove your Can-Am from, uh, with your buddy, um, uh, was it Mike? Uh, street bike, Tommy. Uh, he Tommy went sorry, for half of sorry it. I always get names wrong. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you drove from Canada, uh, down to, uh, the Mexico border and then celebrated, um, with Can-Am down there. Uh, tell us exactly what happened, uh, how that came about and, and tell us a little bit about, uh, the trip there. Yeah. So year years back, I took side by sides and I used the trans American trail and went from ocean to ocean. Uh, that was in 2017. Great time. Learned a lot from that. Um, a lot to take in from that kind of stuff. You know, you kind of need to know roughly how many miles a day you can go safely. Of course, you're always going to need gas. Um, we stay in hotels, stuff like that. Uh, you can plan out camping. It's just a, a whole lot of planning. So, uh, this past September, you know, it, I've been working on this for over a year. I went to the guys at Can-Am and I said, Hey, you know, I already went across country one way. I'd like to go north to south. They were all about it on board. They're like, yeah, you know, we'll help support that. We'll help make that happen. And of course we have numerous other great companies that help make it happen. So it was about a, you know, a solid year of planning. I probably, I probably spent, I would say two months on building the map. Uh, and that's not too much straight. That's just, you know, working off for three or four hours every couple of days. Uh, I kind of, reach around with Google and all that kind of stuff and different people that have mapping and all that kind of stuff and just try to find GPS files that kind of go in the right direction. And then I go back and edit the files and make them go to where I want them to go. Um, we're rolling on uh, machines with tags on them. Um, so Montana is UTV friendly for the roads. Arizona is friendly for the roads. Utah is friendly for the roads. Idaho is friendly for the roads. And these are all mostly county roads. Um, we're not promoting road riding and stuff like that. We're promoting basically cross country traveling. I guess you kind of like, like overlanding stuff like that. Um, our goal isn't to be on pavement. It's to be on gravel roads, dirt roads, forest roads, trails. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it all started. And then we just kind of went from there. I found a start point that lined us up in the right area and kept us on gravel roads. It was an amazing trip. Um, on a trip like this, surprisingly, you're in the mountains. I would say we were in the mountains over half the time because uh, we're kind of following the mountain range. We 
the original thing was to follow a trail called the Great Western Trail. Uh, I got a few different map files of that, and each file has different areas. So I don't really know what that trail is known for. Um, there are certain trails, like the Trans-American Trail is known for dual sport bikes. That's how it was developed. That's how it was mapped. I talked to the guy that originally mapped it and, and did all the editing on it over the years. So we're following a pretty well-known route. The trend or the um, Great Western Trail, like I say, I don't really know what it's from, and I have different variations of it, So, which is good. It gives me options. And then basically just you, you look at the files. You, you basically put out dots of where you want to go. Like I want to go to Butte. I want to go to Ibex. I want to go to Park City. I want to go to Richfield, Utah. You, you throw all those dots, and then you put that with the map file, and then you just kind of edit to reach each dot, basically. So when you're talking about, because we'll get, I just know that we're going to get a lot of questions about GPS files and mapping and things like that. Kind of explain your process there, because I've always used um, Gaia apps on an iPad to do my direction driving when I'm when I'm on the on the trail. Um, but for editing, that's always a big question is you're talking about bringing in multiple GPX files, multiple waypoints, multiple different things. Uh, how do you approach mapping and putting that together? What kind of software do you use and what kind of GPS system are you using on the trail? So everything I use is lead nav and it's all done through an iPad. Um, I use that because I know how to use it. I'm good friends with the owner of lead nav, Damien. He was a, or he is a retail, uh, so Damien is a retired SEAL Team 6 operator. He was very, very big part of mission planning. He's used every GPS under the sun for the military. So he's used everything you could possibly use, and he just kind of took the goods of each and, and kind of put it together and made this app called Lead Nav, and it's on your iPads. And it's a great app. It's got a pretty steep learning curve as far as knowing how to get all the functions out of it. But once you learn it, you got it. It's kind of like anything. It, once you actually get it figured out, it, it's pretty simple. Um, so in short, like you can just Google search GPX files of a certain area, and you might find something you might not. You know, there's uh, what's the guy's name, Kevin's GPS or something like that. There's numerous places you can find GPS files. Um, Leadnav requires a GPX file, so I. I just found all these files between people and online and I bought some and whatever. And then I can load them into the app lead nav and then it'll pull them up. And if you have cell or Wi-Fi, that'll basically show the imagery on the backside of it, whether it's satellite imagery, whether it's road mapping, whatever kind of mapping you want, you can pick which one you want. Now to save that for offline use, uh, it uses a whole lot of gigs and data and stuff like that. And you kind of have to, kind of pre-save it while you have service and then that way you have it once you don't have service um but i kind of hover around with, with a few different apps when i'm trying to make them out just to kind of see because sometimes the uh, app the imagery might be old or the roads might be old so you kind of hover around and kind of make sure i'm still going on something that's semi-recent i actually use google maps a lot mostly for just scrolling around and seeing things and kind of comparing back and forth. So I'm sitting in a chair with, with a laptop and two iPads in my lap and just kind of hovering between all three of them to kind of make sure everything is correct. Cause even on this trip, there was some sections like they, I had routes, but I needed to make a route go from like the bottom of Butte venture over to these County roads and certain imagery it showed a road, but certain imagery, there was no road. It was just basically a trail through a field. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm like, well, I can run with it and that's fine. But if I get there and there's a bunch of gates closed and stuff like that, that's fine. Also, like we're not trying to trespass. We're not trying to force our way by no means. That's just, you got to go turn around and find roads to get around where you're going to go or you're trying to go and then you might run low on gas. So it's a lot of hovering back and forth um, to make sure everything's correct. 
Yeah, when we when we were going across Idaho, very similar trail to where you did um, from north to south. Uh, one important way of of navigating is to make sure you have your backup plans, right? Like, um, and you don't necessarily have to have a backup plan for every like major section, but you should have at least the mapping. Uh, stored on your device so that you can reroute if needed. One of the things that we ran into was either uh, forestry was going in and, and repairing roads, and so they had sections closed, or in our case, maybe fire season. And I think you guys even ran into fire season a little bit when you guys were out there. Um, but uh, you can have whole sections that just go off the map without any notice, without any kind of uh, way for you to know that before until you get there. Um, and a lot of times it does require you to uh, n- turn around. And, and a lot of us adventurer guys don't like turning around. That's like a, <laughs> it's like a, an oxymoron for what we're doing and, and it becomes an issue. And, and so uh, you have to take your, take your um, humble pill and, and turn around and, and not destroy the land and not um, navigate around uh, the lawful requirements of what you're doing. Um, and so I'm definitely not a proponent of, of skipping trails and things like that but uh you do have to have the knowledge and to have the knowledge you have to have the maps uh preloaded and a lot of times uh early on in in my adventuring uh you know you had everything at home ready on the ipad or on the app on your phone or whatever uh, and then you get out there and realize you don't have cell service or whatever so it's super important to remember that you have to be able to download these maps and i can imagine that a full cross-country trip um would be a lot of storage on the iPad, especially with all the data that like lead nav stores on the iPad. Um, and so, uh, one thing I did notice is that when you get out in the clearing, a lot of times you do get cell service, so you can get some of the benefits of satellite maps and stuff like that. But, uh, I definitely tried to hone in on keeping a layer of, uh, you know, the planned trip, a layer of the forestry maps, and then, um, in certain areas, we would also include some other auxiliary information just for, you know, purposes that none of those forestry maps have for like private lands and like Onyx and stuff like that have a little bit more information on certain areas that we would pull pieces into our maps. But I definitely um, on our Idaho trip, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of like eight to 10 gigs of data. And I can imagine being cross country, you're probably going to fill up an iPad pretty fast if you're not planning for that in your purchase of the iPad and, and or whatever device you're using. Yeah, for sure. I I had two iPads on the well, take it back. I had three iPads on the trip. My mom kept an iPad in, in the truck because the truck had to basically chase along with us because uh, I have to get the machines to the north border and then I have to take them back home. So, like the last trip, I had the truck and stuff drop me off at one ocean and then the truck went home <laughs> and, and we had another the other ocean. And then they took us back home, so it, it was fine. But this one, like, since I'm never never going past home because I'm in the southeast in Tennessee, basically a truck had to go with them no matter what. Um, and my mom, I invite her. She's retired, and she just loves being part of anything I do. And, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest of three. I have a younger brother and sister. My brother is a pilot. Uh, he flies small jets. My sister is project manager for some really big companies. Um, so they don't quite do the, the action type experience type stuff. They're living more of a, a normal type of life and that's fine. <laughs> they're not but, the, uh, American redneck family. It's just, it's just Hubert out by himself in the Southeast. A large part of it. But so I invited my mom to come with, she was super pumped and she's like, well, I don't know if I can drive your truck and trailer. Cause I, I have a four door truck with a 40 foot trailer. That's where it takes to haul two machines. And then there's another company, Power Plus. They're a basically power generator solutions company out of Southern California. They've supported Nitro Circus and Nitro Cross and stuff like that. They come on board. They're like, yeah, we want to go. We want to send our our VPs. Our, we want to send employees to be part of the trip. You know, We'll send four to five new people every week. We're going to send our motor home and a trailer to follow along. So that made it easier for my mom because then there's a little convoy of like two vehicles and as long as it, you know, it's big open roads, you know, interstates, and just meet, it at, meet us at the hotel at night. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, she had a great time. But when we, this trip, we would travel for like two to three days, then we'd get to a location, we'd stay there for a couple of days, ride the local area, try to meet with local people, and, you know, riding all and stuff. So my mom would come out, come out and ride for a few hours with me in the, in the Can-Am. And like one day we saw a moose over near Park City, and she was just ecstatic, like so cool to see all the wildlife and, just amazing parts of the country that you really don't see 
on the normal traveling. Um, unless you're going to drive across country, like in most time, that's just down the interstate. You know, they're going down like highways and, you know, smaller areas and stuff like that. So really, really had a good time. But as far as the GPS goes, that's fully, you're fully correct. You need lots of options and you, you kind of need to be prepared. We had two instances where we ran into closed gates. Uh, one of them was on day one. And so we get to a closed gate. We're supposed to take a right and go up over the mountain and, and drop down the other side. So I'm like, all right, well, we'll just, I know we're going south. We always need to be going south and west. So just keep that in mind. And we'll just keep following trails and keep going south, keep going west. We'll eventually get back over to our GPS line. Um, well, we never did. Uh, we, we kept hitting dead end. So we come back to that gate. And we kind of wound around and we got up we're on a clearing. Like you say, we pulled up enough signal that my camera guy, he pulled up Onyx and he had it on his phone. He had a lot of it preloaded. I didn't have that. I had other things preloaded and kind of just kind of looking through the trail lines like, okay, okay. And that'll lead us. And we got back over to our trail and we kept on going, worked out great. Uh, but then we got like, just before we got to Butte, Montana, we were, beautiful little trail going up parallel and across the river and some train tracks and it was a warning trail and then it just stopped there was a gate and the camera guy he uh, james he pulled up the onyx again it was literally a corner of private property so there was a gate <laughs> probably on each little corner he said man i bet it's not half a mile and i, I looked at it and i was like all right well we can go up and around that gate like that's that's not hard but if we get down to the other end, like, I don't really want to trespass, but this is kind of putting us pretty far out. I said, I don't really want to trespass, but if it's a short little run and we can get to the other gate and get around it, that's fine. But if we get there and it's closed and you can't get around it, well, you got to go backwards and you might hit more gates. And I was like, oh, let's not do that. So we went back down, dropped down to the river, took a couple little gravelly side roads and, and eventually got back to where we needed to be. But, you know, there cases like that you know that put us back both of those times put us back about an hour and a half which is not a huge deal uh but then we started hitting fires and that really that really changed our routes big time like we had to kind of reroute completely like stop pull up gps and all that kind of stuff uh, I, I was running an iridium go which is a a satellite communicator and that was purely for the tracking but with that because it pings off to google maps and then for Google to have a live map of us, that's all we needed was I had the website guys set it up and uh, alert GPS. They helped me set up with that. We had their trackers between that and the Iridium Go. We're pinging off, you know, like every five minutes and that showed back on a live map. And that's that way people can see where we're at, see our progress, come be part of it, whatever. And the Iridium, you can send out text through satellite. So that's super handy, kind of a just in case. Um, and then of course I've got a Starlink also, but that's kind of a big box to be carrying, especially on a two seater. Um, the power plus guys, they had a four seater. That's what followed us with their employees and, you know, out to have a good time. Power plus was the ones that kind of helped fund all the, the camera guys and the camera equipment stuff. And then they put together, you know, cool edits for Can-Am and Nitro Circus and myself, which we're still working on my long version of the actual video. So yeah, having options is cool, but it gets expensive when you start carrying all this technology. I mean, we're probably, we're probably rocking, you know, probably, I would say between camera gear and everything, oh, we're rocking like $20,000 worth of gear on these machines. Like no problem. Um, as far as the GPS stuff, you could probably get all that stuff for like under five grand, but you know, some of it's monthly subscription, uh, like the Iridium is, um, you know, the, um, Starlink it's the same way. I did carry Starlink once. It works great. Um, and with the newer versions, you know, maybe you could set one up on your roof and it's pulling data the whole time. Uh, it just, I'm, I haven't looked into that. That's maybe for the next trip. Yeah. I've been working with my buddy George down in California about, uh, building these Starlinks onto these vehicles and, and it actually is changing. It, we throw around the, the term changing the game quite a bit in our industry. Um, and it's become kind of a cliche marketing term, but something about the Starlink is really actually changing how we approach 
things like these adventures, um, how we're approaching uh, media and marketing, how we're approaching um, communication options between teams and families, things like that. It really it is, uh, you know, it, it's not like a revolution, a world changing overnight thing, but it's an evolution that's going to really change um, the ability for us to adventure further and longer uh, in these cars. And, um, you know, it like back in the day when cell phones weren't that great of a service, as far as coverage goes, you would never go multi week trips in a UTV. That would just be, you know, a death sentence. Um, and nowadays we're starting to get to a point where you can pop a satellite, you know, on top of your car on bolt it to your roof and, and be able to get internet pretty much everywhere as long as you got line of sight to the sky. So, um, you know, a lot of things are changing. There's a new, there's new UTVs on the market that are making things easier for overlanding and adventures and stuff like that. Um, and there's a, and there's a bigger knowledge set starting to come into our community where, Oh, we can do that if we just apply ourselves in our, in our, you know, and what our resources are. Um, so when you guys were overlanding, uh, across the country here, uh, you mentioned that you had a caravan and that was a logistics thing, but you also had the ability to stop in uh, various places and, and ride and meet people and have a shower and and all those things, which is really kind of a luxury when you're when you're overlanding in the UTVs. When we did it, we we basically were purely off the car, washing in lakes, you know, taking dips in rivers when possible, you know. Uh, towel baths at night or whatever the case may be. Uh, and, uh, and I like the fact that you did go to hotels and go to cities that were UTV friendly and things like that, because it also shows you there's different levels of this, right? Like you can go and have an amazing experience and live off the car or go city to city and experience the culture or the dining or the whatever. It, it really is something that can be whatever you want it to be. And I know that you guys had a goal of getting border to border and meeting up and, and hitting some different spots. Um, but it really does. We, we live in an era where you can really f define your adventure the way you want it to be. It's You don't have to be limited to the 30 miles around where you live. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that, you know, my original doing of this years ago that was the whole thing is you know, let, let's show what's possible let's show that you can take a, a utv you know outside of just your normal riding area or whatever uh, i mean everyone knows you can trailer up and go ride but i'm just trying to show that you know you can drive them from place to place now you got to do your homework and you got to kind of live on the edge a little bit as far as maybe the legality part of it um i definitely Sadly, I kind of rely on the Nitro Circus aspect of it. Like, I have been pulled over, and I, I can just hope that they have a idea of who I am. Uh, and I'm not trying to be famous by no means, but in general, like, even like my buddies or whatever that have kind of ventured from park to park and stuff like that, uh, if you're super kind and you're super respectful and you do happen to get pulled over, now, we travel the speed limit where we go if not a little bit under, we don't have loud exhaust. We don't run radios wide open. Uh, really just trying to make it like we were never there. Uh, and even as far as the trails and stuff like that go, uh, don't be sliding turns, you know, just traveling along and seeing things and not really being abusive, you know, being good stewards of the land, uh, being safe and all that kind of stuff and very responsible. You really won't have a problem very often. Um, but if you are caught on like a main highway and stuff like that, and they're not designed for the road, they don't have the safety crash testing, all that kind of stuff that a car does. And the, that's why the OEMs don't promote that. And that's why they don't go towards that. You know, it's, it's a whole different animal trying to build a road legal car. The things are expensive enough as they are. And if, if they went to make them road legal, well, the price is just going to go up even more because they have to do the technology and the development and the testing and all that kind of stuff. So that our goal is always to stay on as little pavement as possible. Now you do have to kind of cross roads and kind of venture, you know, little sections, but you know, that's the biggest thing. Like I said, respectful and just be kind to people. Most of the time there is no problem. Uh, they'll be like, all right, well, that's cool. Um, you know, you really shouldn't be doing that, but you know, just be careful, have a good day and just, you know, that's about it. Yeah. When we, when we were traversing like um, through areas where you couldn't avoid the pavement, 
Um, you know, we were always, you know, we had turn signal kits on the cars. We had flashing, uh, we had chase bars in the back, um, you know, various different elements to the vehicle that would, uh, bring attention. A lot of people don't want the attention when they're riding through a city or through an area where it's populated. But if you actually approach it from the idea of like, Hey, letting everybody know caution, I'm a <laughs> off-road vehicle on the pavement. Like just be aware of me, um, using proper speed, using proper turn signals, using, you know, good etiquette on the road, um, being kind, letting everybody else pass, put yourself last, you know, all that kind of stuff where, um, you're, you're really putting everybody else as a priority before you. Um, that'll go a long ways when, um, let's say a forest officer or a police officer or somebody pulls you over a lot of times, like I've been pulled over before where they had no problem with what I was doing. They had no problem with us being there. They were actually pulling us over to let us know about a better way to do it. They were like, Hey, you know, this is all legal. You're doing fine. Don't worry about it. But I just wanted to let you know, there's a better route for you to take that would be save you time and also make everything safer for you and for everybody else. And those guys are awesome. They usually have the best intentions. And as long as you're being respectful of the land, the opportunity, the, the right of ways, um, you can really go a lot farther. Now I'm not saying that in a way where you can just go downtown, down the highway, do whatever, and assume that they're going to be okay with you. Um, you do have to know the laws in every area you go because every County is different. Um, in Washington, where I live, it's free to run on the county roads unless the county tells you not to. And so you got to know each county, you know, independently of what their rules are and then each city within that as well. Uh, so like you said, it does take a lot of planning, but it can definitely pay off. Um, and so from from north to south, what what was your state route and what were some of your favorite spots along the way? Uh, so in short, we started in Montana. Um a little bit of area called Bruceville. Uh, that's basically the Canada, Montana state line. And we found a little pull off right there by the, um, by the border, pulled off a little gravel lot, unloaded right there. And then just zipped over to the border, which was literally like a three wire cattle fence. That's all it was. Um, you know, and it went, you could look down it and it went straight up over the hill and that was all. And over to the right, it's, it's just a little bit two lane highway with a border crossing and that was all there was. And we started hitting uh, roads and went south. And so we were in Montana for a while. And then we went down to Butte and we ventured over to Idaho and drifted down into like American Falls, Idaho. That's where Ibex is. Um, and then from there we went straight south uh, on the mountain range and come out in Park City area and knew some good people there. Um, rode in the Park City area for about a day. Uh, we got there that evening, rode the next day, and then the, the following day we went and met up with um, Kim Block at his place. I texted him and he met us out there, and it was amazing just to go out there. And I've been out there before, but just to show it on a little bit of video and get Street Bike Tommy out there and, and just have a big time for you know just a couple hours. That's the time he had, and he was more than happy to, to be involved with it. And then we drifted down through Utah to Richfield, Utah. And the very bottom, we crossed over the Grand Canyon area in uh, Page. So we drifted down to Page, and then we went back over towards Flagstaff and straight down through Flagstaff around Phoenix, and then down under Flagstaff to Casa Grande, and then we went kind of west and down, and it hit the border. So it was... Um, not a lot of states, probably about 3,000 miles. That's kind of roughly what it was. I think my machines had, they were brand new when they started. Um, had a few break-in miles. I think the machines had like 3,100 miles on them when they're done uh, in a month. So that was, in short, the, the state route and the whole trip. So it was, incredibly, it wasn't a hard trip. Um, the hardest part is, you know, just the hours on end. There was one day coming into northern phoenix area beautiful areas to ride you could see the rain coming well the rain basically surrounded us and we were caught in the rain for the last two hours we kept going over these mountain ranges and we were we were heading west. We knew we would eventually hit interstate 17 and that's where our hotel was and that's where the truck stops were and i knew right where we were going to come out but we'd go over a mountain and i'm like all right just over that mountain there's interstate 
No, there goes another one. There goes another one. We crossed like eight or nine mountains, and finally we got to the, the main road. But it, and we rode in the rain for the last two and a half. Camera guy that was right with me. He loves the cold and he hates the heat. And he was looking at me, and he was just like covered up in his in his coat. And he said, "Man, this sucks." I said, "Well, what do you want to do?" I said, "Do you want to just sit here in the rain, or do we keep moving and eventually get out of it?" I said, you know, either way, we're in the rain. We might as well keep moving. And he's like, no, 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 keep going. I'm just saying it sucks. <laughs> so, I mean, that was that was probably the worst part of the whole trip. Yeah, the preparing for the weather is always an interesting thing on these trips. Um, you really kind of like when we were doing it, you know, we weren't stopping at hotels or doing anything where everything had to live in the back of the car. Right. And so you're like, OK, where can I stick a jacket? Where can I stick a, you know, I, I had brought a uh, frog tog set and and bundled it up real tight under under the back of the seat so I could quickly pull it out of the seat without undoing the whole cage and everything. Um, but, you know, ha- not having an enclosed car, um, you really have to be prepared for that and be willing to sacrifice a little bit of comfort when in time comes. Uh, but, you know, it, it it's one of those things where you go back all the best stories, all the best memories all have a certain element of unpreparedness, a little bit of, of suffering, a little bit of overcoming. And you really have to be able to uh, have that grit to go out and do it. And, you know, my kids, we, we had a, we went, um, we rode our, our UTVs up to a mountaintop to watch the 4th of July celebrations one year where we could see like three different cities. Everybody was shooting off fireworks. It was a really cool experience, you know, campfire, uh, you know, the whole nine yards. The one thing we didn't think about was getting back to camp at like midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And the fact that we drove like two and a half hours to where we were like, you don't think about having to get back at camp at 3 AM when it's like 40 degrees out and you're moving at 30 to 40 miles an hour and nobody brought jackets and nobody brought anything and everybody's freezing and everybody's cold. And, uh, but that's one of their favorite memories, right? Like going out and adventuring up to a mountaintop to watch this thing. And then this long, miserable trip back and and the next day packing up, like those are the best stories. And I think that, you know, obviously with a long adventure, like, like what we're talking about, you really do have to do as much planning as possible because you get safety is a big part of it. But the, as far as getting your family out and experiencing the world and and the adventure of an off-road vehicle, um, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of like, yeah, I'll just not bring that and then we'll figure it out as we go because it really does make for the best memories in my opinion. Yeah. I mean this, this trip, you know, we had rain gear on each vehicle for everybody cause I had a, an X3 XRS and I had a, a good storage pack on the back of it and then door bags and a roof bag and, and stuff like that. And then we had the commander two seat and it's of course got a dump bed and we have a little rack on top. So we have storage above and then our cooler underneath and then storage beside it and then the power plus guys they had a four seat xrs um and there was most of the time there was four of them so they might be in with one of us or whatever but they had a roof rack so we had the room to carry the things but sometimes those scenarios they pop up pretty fast um it's pretty cool out in the west you can see the weather coming for a long ways um, we're here in the East, like here at the Strongland, this shop is down in like a little, a little hole area. So there's trees all the way around us. So when we see clouds, it's going to rain in about 10 minutes. Um, out there, you can see it for hours on end and, you know, we're kind of venturing through and we see the clouds coming like, all right, you know, we'll get ready for it. Um, but that was, you know, it, it was a good day, but the rain was, it was pretty harsh. And of course our machines, we didn't have windows and all that kind of stuff. We left them open because it was a warmer time of year. And then the only other bad time, and it wasn't a bad time, but it was a rough time. We were going through the mountains between Spanish Fork, Utah, down to Richfield. And we're up in the mountain range, and you can see that it's it's getting cloudier. And we keep driving, keep driving, and we eventually, we're up on top of this mountain range, like Alpine Drive or something like that is what that road was called. And um, we're literally in fog and sleet and snow and you can't see a hundred feet in front of you. Like, and we're, we're running down trails. That, like I can see off my side when I was on the, on the side of the mountain where I saw the drop off. I mean, it dropped off, you know, not vertical, but near vertical. It's a truck wide, you know, it's 12 feet wide. And you look down and it, 
you don't see the bottom. I'm like, well, you know, we'll just, I'll, and I'm leading, so I'm kind of controlling the speed and trying to keep everybody at a slower pace. And we stop one time, and the camera guys all get out, and they're like, what in the hell have we signed up for? Because these guys had just hopped in for that section. <laughs> um, we, It's one of those things. We can't sit here and wait it out. We have to keep moving. We'll eventually get out of it. Uh, we, if we keep going south and we keep, you know, south and east, that'll east or west, or either side of the range will get us out of the tops of the mountains, and maybe we can get a different route, but we have to keep going. And, and we did, and it worked out just fine. But <laughs> there's some times you're like, man, this is not quite what I planned. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the trip overall is an adventure. What were some of the, the favorite, like, viewpoints and memories of, like, just stopping at the top of the mountain or, or in a range and, and saying, wow, this is a view that you don't get anywhere else? What were some of those uh, moments? I mean, we ran into those kind of views nearly every day because we were up in the mountains a lot. Um you know, Montana has some beautiful views up there, looking over the cities and looking over the valleys. And, and I love areas where you're looking over valleys and there's nothing else out there. Like there are no towns, there are no people, there might be a house or something way up out there. Um, I love those kind of views just because it's like, you know, you're, it makes you, makes you realize how small you really are. Um, you're the only people out there and there's nothing else out there. Um, some of the, some of the more fun memories are, are always the more funny ones. We, we're going down this same mountain range. We get out of the snow and stuff like that. And we're, you know, and what's cool out there is you go through the mountain ranges, you can see the roads, you know, venture all the way across. And you know, that's where we're going. Cause I can, you can kind of look on the GPS and see the line and see that and say, Oh, we'll be over there on the other side of that Valley here in about an hour. And we stop and we look, look over to the left. I bet there's over a thousand sheep sitting there in the Valley. Some, some of them are on the road. Uh, the little gravel road we're at and just hundreds, maybe thousands of sheep. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, free range, whatever. And you can see that there's sheep dogs out there with them. And Tommy's buddy that was with us that day, he's a, um, he's world's strongest veteran. He holds a record for one arm dumbbell at like 255 up over his head. Um, and he, he's a veteran, he, super nice guy. got tons of stories and, you know, incredibly strong and stuff like that. Just a fun dude. He see those. He sees the sheep, so he says, "I'm going to go over there and try to pet one." And I was like, "You better stay away from them dogs. Them dogs don't know people. They only know keep those sheep safe." So he gets down in the brush and he starts crawling. And here comes a dog up out of the <laughs> up out of the brush. Boom! And he stood up and kind of backed off. And I'm like, "Yeah, you probably should stand up and go to them. If you crawl, they're going to think you're a predator and they're going to come after you." Well, he didn't mess with them after that. Anymore. <laughs> the the <laughs> i can imagine this the the i can imagine as a camera guy like just fil filming that and be like oh this is gonna be good this is gonna turn out great but uh the uh one of the trips we took through washington we went through this area where they had the last free range herd of sheep in washington in that area um, and so that was cool to see that. And as a city person, you don't really think about the fact that there's these, these big groups of animals that are living off the land. And then, you know, there's, there's technically somebody that, that shepherds them, but they, they're kind of like just allowed to go do whatever they want. Um, and so when you're out on the trail, you never know. We always think like, oh, a deer will jump out or whatever. You never, ex you never expect to come around a corner at speed and then see, you know, a few hundred sheep or a hundred cows or, or whatever on the trail. But one of my, like you were saying, the memories, one of the favorite memories I have of some of those trips is, you know, being on comms with the cars, right? And we're every once in a while, somebody will throw out a joke or somebody will call out something. Hey, this is coming up ahead. Um, and uh, one of the, one of the funny things was one of the guys up front was saying, Hey, lots of mud, be slow down, pull your arms in the windows, whatever. And then like, 10 seconds later, the next guy behind him says, that wasn't mud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were running um, intercoms and radios. We were using the, the rugged, the GMRS radios, which they had told me they said, these will work better for what you're doing because they're more made for wooded mountain areas where the race radios are more of line of sight. And, you know, as a, as a group, we were never more than a quarter mile, half a mile apart as far as from front car to back. Uh, just enough stale dust. And then I had a, another radio in my truck that would reach out to us. You know, we could 
she could be listening and hear when we get close because we're talking back and forth. And um, yeah, I mean we're running along and yeah, like okay, there's truck, car, and then we come around and turn sheep, sheep, wait, wait, sheep, <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> It's definitely fun to call those things out, but I'll, I'll say I was, and this is not a plug whatsoever, uh, I was impressed by the radios. You know, for us, just traveling together as a group, you know, I might have crossed over the mountain. So I was on one side of the mountain, they were crossing over still on the other side of the mountain, you know, like a half mile apart or something like that. You know, we still was able to connect and talk very well. Uh, we got up on top of a range and we were stopped. We were going to the bottom of the range. There was a gas station down there. We were going to meet the truck down there. And we are talking about the comport. We are going, I said, all right, let's stop right here and get a picture. And then my mom, we all named her Mother Goose. And Mother Goose called on the radio, Mother Goose to the crowd. <laughs> and we talked for a minute. She said, I'm going to go on and go to the hotel because y'all are right there. And I'm going to make sure I get a good parking spot. And I'm like, all right, you know, we'll, we'll see you there. I pulled it up later on. And I, I used GPS and drew a straight line. And we were 20 miles from... The rain for where she was to us was exactly a twenty mile straight line. Um, so I was pretty impressed on like, man, that that's some serious reach out there to be able to reach and, and still communicate kind of a just in case something happened or whatever. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, when we get into these side by sides, we're always looking for the biggest, bestest, bestest baddest upgrades that we can do and so like when it comes to comms everyone's like i want the biggest radio with the biggest wattage and the you know the big race series guys whatever those guys are out in the desert i want that like that's what they assume they need uh but like especially up here in the northwest where i'm at uh the uhf does way better than the vhf and all the race guys are using vhf uh, because it's a much narrower band that goes a lot further, um, where like you were saying, line of sights, uh, more of a big deal. Uh, but up in the mountains, UHF is much better. It has a, a wider frequency that, that can go around stuff and bounce around stuff way easier than VHF and the GMS, um, the GMRS and the, and those frequencies are all in that range. So they work really well. And then when you put on top of that are just a really quality preamp and an amplifier behind it um especially with like the newer rugged radios where they've they've redeveloped their whole product lines um they do really well and and you don't have to spend thousands of dollars on your comms anymore you can actually get a pretty affordable kit and still have intercar comms and all that stuff and now they have the digital versions that are making things super clean and easy to listen to so shout out to those guys for really uh keeping the effort behind putting out quality products yeah, and that, and that was not like a, a plug or a sale whatsoever. That was just like a real life experience. Like, holy cow, you know, it, it's reaching very well, uh, actually far better than what I thought it would reach. And then to hear that it actually reached like 20 miles, plus with the new blue tape, the Bluetooth capability and stuff like that, you know, you can be cranking music and listening, but then it'll it'll dim down when people start talking, then it goes back up. And, you know, I've, I've only used this stuff really for racing, and I don't race a crazy lot, like a few times a year mostly just for fun and just to show that like, you know, a, a normal, you know, mechanical redneck can go out there and race and be semi-competitive with the guys that race for a living. Um, so I've used the racing stuff and then to, to work a rugged and, and see the more recreational side and stuff that really works really great in those environments. It was, it was super impressive. And like anyone that was going to do this kind of stuff, I would advise to have, you know, a similar type of setup for communications. You know, you pick what you pick and you do what you do, but, you know, just kind of go and kind of look around and, and kind of read from experience. Um, that's really, it yeah. seemed to work very well. And the, the nice thing about what you were talking about, the GMRS stuff, is it's a non-licensed product. Like, you don't have to have a radio ops license. You don't have to have... Uh, a hand like a, a ham handle and all this other stuff like guys will buy these these ham radios and stuff like that and they're going to be technically uh, skirting the law with that uh, and the new the new stuff with the GMRS stuff is is performing super good and and able to communicate at distance uh, without you having to ever worry about that so um, very good products that um, from all the different vendors in that area where all the new techs and all the new chips are making um, communications way easier um, so at the end of your trip you you arrive at Mexico what happened there was a big event you guys had down at the bottom at the border what was going on there um, so so it was pre-planned um, through can am um, was it it's October 8th I believe and I, I'm sorry if I don't remember that. I believe it's October 8th it's the same day as Travis's birthday uh, is Can-Am's uh, social media holiday called International Off-Road Day. And in short, they're just trying to get everybody outside riding. Um, 
You know, if you're in a, in a can am, wonderful. If you're not, it doesn't matter. You know, just everybody get outside and ride and have a good time and all that kind of stuff. And and also promoting the the stewardship and courtesy and keeping the lambs good and the safety and all that kind of stuff, all in the same. Um, so for that last day, we worked with a dealership down in that area, uh, in the Casa Grande area, Can Am dealership, and they had a lot of knowledge of that southern Phoenix area. So we we used the mapping I had, but then he had some better routes to get us down to the actual border wall. That way we truly went border to border and had other great people meet up. Uh, Jason Cobb and his family, they own Kiel Speed Shop and the Trophy Light Series. They're a uh, Can-Am outfitter as far as the rental side of it. Uh, Uncharted Society is what that's called. So Jason and them, they drove down. They're like north side of Phoenix, so they drove down to the area where we, where we were starting from met us there and we spent the day we went down to the border uh we passed some signs that say warning there's traffickers and smugglers and stuff like that so just be aware of your surroundings <laughs> we saw some border patrol people um and then we got down to the border and we saw the wall and took our pictures and stuff like that and then we ventured back up and met the truck at the highway and and loaded up but i mean it, that was another day we got caught in the rain <laughs> yeah, we would all we had made the whole trip uh, only got the rain once, and then we got the rain on the way back from the border, getting back up to where the truck was meeting us for the final leave out. So it was a it was a great time, great group of people, a lot of a lot of great people just come have a fun with us, and a lot of great people and companies helped it all happen. You know, between their products and whatever else they did to help make the trip as easy as possible. I mean, at the end of the day, it was it was easy but not you know it's only as easy as how much you plan for it um it's my trip so i better not get tired of it because i'm the one that organized it all and i never did there was some days tommy was like man this is this is a lot of dust and i want some real food outside of a gas station <laughs> and when you're trying to be you know kind of when he's trying to be on a certain diet and you're trying to work out and stuff like that and do this kind of stuff, it's not exactly easy. It's capable. I mean, for sure it's capable. You know, you've got to kind of pre-plan and pre-pack lots of food and stuff like that. And him and um, his buddy that was, that was with us, that was a strongman competitor, you know, he just had to keep in mind, you know, I, I need to take on so many calories. I need to take on so much protein. I need to stop and lift some rocks or do push-ups or whatever kind of stuff like that just to, to kind of keep a base fitness and that's what he does for a living. So it, it fully makes sense. Uh, <laughs> I'm a mechanic for a living and I move dirt and, uh, you know, drive side by sides and stuff like that. So my diet's a little bit different <laughs> compared to theirs. I can't wait but, to see the know, video it, of it, him just on the side of the trail, just like, hoo -yah, hoo -yah, it's a big rock. Yeah. Hoo -yah. Actually, actually that did happen. We come out, out of uh, a trailway system between Richfield and page Arizona, beautiful area. Uh, a little bit less trees get into like red rocks and you know all that kind of stuff just beautiful beautiful area we stop we get down to the highway and we're stopped we're taking a taking a eat break and stuff like that and there's huge piles of rocks well dump trucks were hauling those rocks into where we came from and working on the road and stuff like that and big boulders and he just goes over there and he, the loader is loading rocks into the truck well he stops the guy and says hey can i put some rocks in your bucket and the guy's like yeah sure so he grabs these rocks that are like i don't know like two or three feet around and just grabs them and and pulls them on his chest and throws them he does like three or four of them and i'm like holy shit man and i mean he rips his shirt all up and he's just like yeah he's just so pumped and i was like how much rocks weigh he's like well he said i'm guessing that heaviest one was probably about 350 and <laughs> i was like holy cow just stop guys gotta stop and get a lift in right quick <laughs> yeah, I can imagine for a, for someone that's working in in bodybuilding or or strength conditioning that the idea that stressing your muscles makes you feel better when you and because when you don't do it you feel sluggish your your body's kind of fatigued because it's not doing it. Um, so, what cars did you take and what prep did you did you do to your cars uh, for the trip and how did they end up? Like, what kind of how many flats did you get or or did you break any axles things like that? Yeah, so as far as as far as machines, cars, whatever you want to call them, that I took, I had an X3 XRS. Uh, it was a Smart Shocks model, and then I had a Commander XMR, um, and then the, the 
camera guys slash power plus, you know, that sent all their employees. They had a four seat uh, XRS X3 Can Am. Um, as far as prep goes, I went ahead and put rhino axles in all of them. And I'm talking about the prep on my machines, uh, my two machines. So I ran rhino axles and I run super ATV parts and all that kind of stuff. And I think they make a very, very good part. Uh, and it's affordable and good warranty and all that kind of stuff. So I run rhino axles, um, maybe not a must, but I, I just knew the abuse they'll take and the hours and miles they'll take. Um, axles, not really a, a huge thing, but we had spare axles in the trailer, kind of a just in case, mostly if you rip a boot, you rip a boot, boot and you lose all your grease, it's eventually going to wear out and maybe something will happen. Been there, um, done that. So I ran... <laughs> Back then, anyway, and it could be a small thing like you caught a stick, ripped a boot, lost all your grease. Eventually, it's going to fail. Um, if the boot never ripped, it may not never fail. But you know, I ran heavier axles, I ran light bars on them for just in case night riding, turn signal kits. Um, for the X3, the X3 was basically our fuel vehicle, uh, so we didn't have to carry gas cans. So I used the AGM under seat tank which can either pump into the gas tank itself or it has a buddy hose where you can pump into another vehicle. I think it held like seven or eight gallons. So I had that under the seat of the X3 and then I use trail tank. They have a 14 gallon, uh, basically OEM replacement tank on the X3. So the X3 was carrying about 23, 24 gallons of fuel. Um, there's nothing like that offered for the uh, commander. So basically knowing that I had 14 gallons on the X3, and then the extra also, I had to stop, we had to stop and fill the commander up twice. Um, and we just ran, ran, ran and like, you know, let it run out. It's fine. We'll just, we'll stop and fill it when we need. And then the, um, the guys in the four seater, they had the trail tank also. Um, of course, rugged radios, like I said, turn signal get street legal kit basically is what they call it, which I, I'll, I'll tell everybody right out of the gate. There's, there's places that try to sell you on street legalizing a utv you know you can do turn signals blinkers all that kind of stuff the legal requirements um like where i'm from tennessee arizona utah idaho north south dakota montana you know all those states i think even oklahoma's doing it now those states they will sell you tags for your utv In most cases that tag is really only good for county roads and they're not really oriented towards highways and stuff like that there are kind of loopholes where you could you could set up an LLC in another state, get a tag through the LLC, and put it on your machine, but that doesn't necessarily mean your machine is legal for the roads in every state. Uh, so you really need to do the research on that kind of stuff as far as where you're going, what they honor, what they don't honor. So my Tennessee tag on my UTV, well, it's no good in Kentucky because Kentucky doesn't tag them. It doesn't matter that I tagged my utv if they don't honor it they don't honor it and that can go state county town like you said county road um so people really like to push on that um so i'll, I'll just say that i can tell you from firsthand experience just because your tag doesn't mean you're necessarily okay in that area like like we talked earlier as long as you're you know good stewards and, and kind and respectful most of the time there's not really an issue but tags i I kind of did a little bit of homework. I put the same tires and same tire size on both my machines. So I didn't have a variation. So the commander had 32s and the X3 had 32s and had the same tire. So X3 carried a spare and that spare was good for two machines. And then the other guys in the other X3, they carry a spare for their stuff. And then I had spares in the trailer also, but I just really tried to, to limit what I really needed to carry. That way I could carry other things that are needed, like, you know, tools and, and rain gear and food and stuff like that. I'd rather carry stuff that's really, really useful than, and, and a spare tire is useful, but just knowing the terrain we're going in, there shouldn't really be an issue unless you catch a nail or, you know, catch an edge of a rock or something like that, which is pretty rare as long as you are paying attention. Yeah, the um, the, the you know, thing about group tr group rides is is being prepared together, not individually. Like so when we did group rides, you know, one guy had, you know, a jack or one guy had the spare tire or one guy had uh, the axles or whatever. 
and communicating well with each other so that you had, um, you know, common parts as much as possible, just so that everyone uh, knew what they had, knew what the options were. If you have a mix between different OEMs or whatever, account for that, then, you know, those guys carry their own spares in certain areas. Um, you know, and having common tire sizes, wheel sizes are all great options for group rides like this. Um, and it really comes down to, like you were saying, how prepared you are is how, uh, how your experience is going to turn out. <clears throat> and so I really think that, um, uh, a lot of guys get really fancy with their cars and have these really kind of like elaborate setups. And I think the more simple you can do it, uh, the more of a easier time you're going to have in prep, but also the more fun you're going to have an experience while you're out. Yeah, for sure. We, we kept them kind of as basic as possible. Um, run, you know, a, a lot of OEM parts, um, put stronger parts kind of where I, I kind of figured, all right, well, that, that could be an issue like an axle or something like that. But, you know, we run stock hubs, brakes, all that kind of stuff. And it's more so just from my experiences, I, I know what this part will do and I know what it takes to break it. So we'll kind of go that route, but other areas, you know, like we run stock arms, um, and many other things. And of course we'd stop, you know, every couple of days since I had the trailer there, I pull a grease gun out and I grease all the pivots, um, check over the axles, check over the bearings, you know, jack it up, check the wheels. Uh, the, the commander, our, um, our veteran buddy, Nick, uh, strong guy, you know, awesome, awesome dude. But we were running some, I, I would say, power line trails over near the Richfield area. We were following some local people, government officials. They were showing us some awesome trails. And we were on our way back. And we were cruising down these little gravel, you know, paths pretty quickly. But it, it wasn't like graded super smooth, you know, and it was windy up and down hills, all that kind of stuff. And the guys that were leading us were going a little faster than what I – prefer to run when i know there's a group behind me i prefer to go a little bit slower kind of control the speed of the group because if if i control the speed i'm i'm controlling the possibility of something going wrong um unless you got people like tommy that will back off and sit there for five minutes and they'll just run like 80 or 90 down these roads i mean you've got to calm down because if something happens, if a cow runs out or something like that something happens i was like it's gonna be bad so let's just try to keep her calm here but I mean, he's all about having a good time and I'm all about that too. And in a controlled environment, you know, you get up over a range, you can see for as far as you can see, you know, be a little more lenient, but some of these areas like this gravel road, you know, it's pretty windy, pretty back and forth. And we're running along and we, I hear over the radio that like, hold on, hold on. We got, we, we got a flat, we got a flat. And I was like, okay, okay, that's fine. Well, the guys that were in front of us that were leading us, well, they didn't stop. We didn't have, we didn't have inner, um, intercoms stuff with them i flashed my lights and never turned around but they were supposed to stop at each stop or intersection anyways go back and i pull up and um the little commander's leaning over pretty hard and i was like all right well maybe that's just a flat and it wasn't it was a little bit more than that it was a broken ball joint and a flat and you know a, a twisted sway bar link and, and some other things and i was like what's going on here like what happened <laughs> he's like well you know i, well, I went it, it kind of just acted kind of funny. Well, it was dirt banks and he banked off one and then he slid and he banked off the other one. And he was probably running, I, I would say he's running 50 or better. And, you know, he, he, he played it off and no one was hurt and it was all right. I had parts and stuff like that and we got it fixed and no big deal. But that incident that cost us having to basically tow it out of there and not get out of there till like midnight. Luckily we were only like six miles from town. Um, tow it out of there, you know, fix it at a dealership the next day. The dealer, they opened the doors on Sunday, um, between the guys that we were riding with work there, knew the owners. They like the open doors here, whatever you need. So we pulled up in the shop. We put, you know, I, I had parts to put some parts on it. Uh, I had a spare hub. I had a spare bearing carrier. So we put new, new parts on it and we got it back going, but it was kind of one of those things like, Oh, you know, it, it happens that fast and we're done. Um, so let's, let's try to keep it, keep it in check and stuff like that. So, you know, it all works out. It's just, you definitely, like you say, you got to plan for, for kind of the what if, uh, you know, if you do this all the time, like yourself, me and numerous other people, I'm not bragging upon us, but we kind of have a general understanding of what we are capable of and what we can put a machine through and know it'll last and know it won't last. 
So this kind of stuff on a car, we shouldn't really have any problems outside of maybe gas and maybe a flat tire. Um, but we put people in there that haven't done it as much. You kind of get over your head kind of quickly. He's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know I had a flat tire. And I was like, he's like, I just thought the gravel was kind of slippery. I'm like, well, did you think to stop and check it? He's like, well, I was just trying to keep up. I'm like, well, that's fine. And I was like, it, it all's fine. It all worked out. I said, but did you notice the other day when you were riding with Tommy, he heard something funny. He just stopped in the middle of the trail. He's like, I'll stop and I'll check it and make sure it's okay. And then I'll keep going. Tommy stopped. He said, Hey, I, I hear something. I said, all right, cool. I came back to him. We looked over it, kind of did a shakedown. No, it's fine. Keep going. And if you hear it, stop, we'll check it again. Well, <laughs> Nick didn't do that. He kept going, trying to keep up with the group and you know, <laughs> it is what it is. It's all fine. But at the same time, it's like, just kind of be aware of your surroundings. <laughs> yeah. You definitely have to take into consideration that, uh, you, you're not next to an auto parts store. You're not next to the shop. You're not next to the truck. You really have to think a little about a little bit differently about how you approach these things and, and, and be a little bit more restrained on what you're doing. Um, and so it seems like for the most part you had a successful run and nothing really failed you per se. Um, you were, did you take that car and then turn that into the hammers car? Cause you, you followed this trip trip up right into prepping for hammers and went and raised hammers. Uh, what was that transition? Like what, what was your car? Did you use the same car as last year or did you use it, that car and rebuild it into an off-road hammers car? How did that all turn out for you? Oh, okay. So, so in short, we got done with that, that trip, took the machines home, um, kind of did just a, a once over on them. The commander, I, you know, went back to original size wheels and tires because uh, we use it for trails and around the farm and stuff like that. Uh, the X3, I basically converted it to using it for trail rides and pre-running King of the Hammers in it. And then my my machine or race car, whatever you can call it, I race, is the same one I've raced every year at King of the Hammers. Very fortunate to be in the situation where that all, that's all that X3 does is it races. So it's set up for King of Hammers. And when I say set up, like it, that's a pretty loose term. Um, and King of Hammers and Ultra 4, they're semi lenient. Um, it's not like short course and stuff like that, where you got to have door bars and it's all got to be welded in and stuff like that, or hard best in the desert. Um, like those series, you've got to have a fuel cell, you got to have, you know, kind of a lot of safety stuff, and you're kind of sacrificing a whole vehicle. Uh, my King of Hammers race machine is following the safety standards which is a a good strong six point cage uh your bumpers have to be past your tires uh i run a super atv like box arms heavier arms heavier axles heavier tie rods um the steering rack all that kind of stuff you know just stronger parts but the radiator is still in the front i still have the bed on the car like the original bed uh i have racing seats in it just to hold you better of course, intercoms, uh, window nets, fire extinguishers. You know, it's basically a stock machine with just bolt-on stuff. Um, where I've had full-on desert-built machines, and that's all they are for is for racing. So they have fuel cell. You know, the cage is all welded in. You got to climb in and out of it and all that kind of stuff. For my hammer scar, the doors open on it. It's just had secondary latches, which are a safety requirement. Um, so the cross-country machine went to King of the Hammers as a pre-running vehicle because you know that th this was my fifth year i think racing king of hammers uh it gets easier every year as far as just knowing what you're coming into knowing the land kind of knowing what's where so it's not really like a holy cow it's just like well we're going up this this year instead of going down it uh, or we're not hitting this year this route this year we're hitting this route so i don't really stress on king of hammers any anymore it's more you know i always want to finish i want to finish inside the time frame you'd love to finish you know in a, in a very good position but to be real like the guys that like kyle cheney and the millers and all that kind of stuff you know they're they're professional drivers they're there to win and can am looks upon them to win so to be at that level i mean you have to be committed the way they are you know there ain't no telling what they spend they have amazing cards and and such as that but yeah, so that machine went straight into that. I did a, a few little changes, you know, wheels, tires. Um, I did put, you know, stronger front arms on it because I knew it was going to be dragging over a lot of stuff just with the rocks. 
and basically ran it like that. My race machine, same thing from last year. It got a new wrap, new, um, I don't, yeah, I, I did new lower arms, uh, new ball joints, new bushings as far as in the arms, new axles, new bearing carriers. Um, I, I joke around and say I'm still in the original belt, and it's a 2020 model. Uh, but I did put a new belt in it this year just for the heck of it. Uh, <laughs> do, so, do you, you know, uh, do you run stock trailing arms? Um, so on the machine that was pre-running, I had stock trailing arms. Uh, and Super ATV makes these trailing arms. It basically, um, the Super ATV trailing arm skids, they slide up over the arm like they kind of in, encage it or whatever. And they have sliders on the bottom. And so I ran those. <laughs> they work very, very well. It kind of keeps the abuse off the arm itself because it has the little sliders on the bottom. Uh, it worked really well. The race machine, I have the Super ATV box trailing arms. Um, they give a little bit better clearance because they're not quite so thick as far as how tall they are. So you have a little bit better, better clearance over the rocks. And uh, I just know they're extremely tough. You know, when it comes time to race, you're going to hit things quite a bit harder than what you would just pre-running because pre-running you're just trying to see the area i'm i'm just going to drive through it cautiously if i can get through it pre-running at a at a nice easy pace um i know i can get through it racing it's just going to be we're going to be hitting things a little bit faster to hurry up and get on over it so how was the race i mean watching it from my end um you know i was hoping to be up there this year it didn't work out uh and and it looked like the course had faster overall uh components to it but it had a few tricky spots that caught a lot of people up like the sand wash um at the bottom of the hill um you know <laughs> seeing uh campbell take that rock at the top of the hill and tumble all the way down was pretty pretty interesting um but there was a few different little parts of the course that seemed like to catch people off guard and i think it mostly dealt with sand and and speed um but how was your race experience what was your, what was your thoughts on that um you know it's it's one of those i think many many people say this king of hammers is a love hate thing um it's super cool to be out there it's super cool to go like trail ride that stuff and challenge yourself but racing over it um it's fun but it's not it just depends on how your day's going uh if you're doing good it's fun and if you're not well it's not fun at all uh they know what they've done in years past and, and this year too they usually start us on the desert side of it right out of the gate so which is good. It, it kind of lets people separate out. And because if you shoved everybody like all hundred and something drivers and they're leaving every 30 seconds, two at a time. Um, and if you, you threw them right into the rocks, right out of the gate, it'd be a traffic jam right away. And then, you know, it, it'd be fair to say that like over half the field wouldn't even have a chance at finishing in the time frame. So to run them right out of the desert, you know, that that's super cool. And the desert's not, incredibly hard it's just being cautious being knowing where the dangers are and where they're not and you know drive your pace like i really don't drive over 70 75 miles an hour just because that's where i'm comfortable so i probably lose a lot of time in the desert compared to kyle and them running you know consistently 80 to 90 or better um so you know that's fine i just do what i'm comfortable because my goal is to finish and, and have a good time this year king of the hammers they years past they've it's only been one UTV class. Uh, I think last year's first year, they split it up with numerous classes. So you had um, Pro Stock, Pro Stock Turbo, NA, Unlimited, and something else. So I think there was like four classes. This year, I uh, got an email a few weeks out and said, we're going to offer a sportsman stock class. Well, that that's where I live. Uh, I'm sportsman. My car is basically stock outside of the safety requirements. So I entered... They changed my entry and put me in there. And the nice thing about that is you're still doing the same course, but they they took us out of, I think, three sections that are really hard rock sections. I'm not saying we can't do them, but they're trying to get more people interested in trying. So if they give you a slightly easier course, and not easier, but you know, we'll take out some of the harder parts. Some of the bottlenecks. Um, yeah, and some of the bottlenecks and stuff like that, it was like, trying to introduce some some new people to it and give people a chance. Because if you go on UTV class and you, had, you know, okay, so I think this year there was 118 entries 
as far as overall for all the UTVs, I finished, I want to say, I want to say I finished 30, 30 to 35 overall. I was across the finish line. Um, and when I crossed the finish line, there was about an hour and a half left on a time frame. And I think only four people finished by me within the time frame. So, you know, over half the field is not making it. So why would you even go try that? Right. And uh, they, they this, came out with that greenhorn program this year too, where, you know, all the new drivers that were new to the whole idea had this opportunity to, to go learn and experience before race day and, and have a little bit better of a chance to compete um, as a first, as a first year entrant into the race. And I thought that was super cool for them to do. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. The funny thing is there was nobody in UTV class from that. Um, that was all, you know, different classes, whether it's 4,400 or 4,300 or whatever they've got. I don't even know all the classes, but so the sportsman salt class, you know, that was definitely like my wheelhouse. I'm like, all right, you know, that, that definitely makes me feel better. Um, they took out, we went around one. King's veto or something like that. We went, went to a, we went around it, but we went up a different way, which I had been up before and I knew it was hard. It's just be patient, take your time. You'll get up. It had to winch up one little rock because it was just so eat out. Um, and that was the only time we winched the whole race. And then like we get to, to Jack North, we took a left and went down through the valley and come in instead of going all the way around to Jack Hammer. And all that kind of stuff and we've done those before in years past because i've raced them in years past um, but to know we didn't have to go through like the extreme gnarly stuff and almost guarantee to winch um really it felt a lot better um at the end of the day i finished second in class um in the sportsman stock class so super pumped about it. i was pumped just to finish in the time frame went across the podium did our little talks and all that kind of stuff took some pictures at the can-am booth and then I went back to the truck and basically almost went to bed. And I was, I looked the next morning and people like can him highlighted my, my name and all that kind of stuff. And like second in class, well, I didn't know. I didn't check that kind of stuff. I was just like, all right, well, yeah, we finished. And then they're like, oh, why weren't you at the podium? I was like, well, I didn't know about it. Like <laughs> they, they were doing like the overall result or, you know, per class results podium. They literally did it like 15 minutes after I left. Like no one even stopped me and said, hey, hey, you know, stop and check this. You might be in the running or something like that. I'm like, well, <laughs> sorry, I didn't make it. You know, I did go up there later on to get uh, like get dinner and like half the food was gone. I'm like, all right, well, um, that's cool, I guess. <laughs> so it, it's well, super cool well, to get. I always think that the podium thing afterwards is always like this chaos Right. Like the after race, like you get, you get three seconds to like wash your face off and get a drink of water and like prep to be on camera. And then, and then you're there. Um, and I know that, you know, as far as standings and times and, and placements, you, you would think that in this day and age that the computers would just have it figured out, but there's so many logistical and, and, and penalties and, and all these different things that come into play. Um, it's super hard for, for everyone to know that up front, but but I always call the, the, the finish line, the chaos pool, right? Everybody's just running around yelling at people doing stuff. You go there, you do this, you, you know, it's, it, you don't really understand that unless you go and actually experience it at the finish line with everybody. It kind of, unless, unless you're in a class that is like a trophy truck class where it's like, you obviously are the winner or, you know, something like that. It's really hard to understand the full grasp and the full um, breath of the, of the situation when, unless you're there seeing it firsthand. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you get, you get the, the leading pack of UTVs come across the line and, and most of them are, a lot of them are in the same class. Um, so there was like three pro classes and so they're not the same class, but they're all kind of competing for that, you know, first overall win. And then it starts getting mixed up more and more and more. And of course I was in a, my own little class and what the funny thing is, so this year they did qualifying over at chocolate thunder and that's where you were saying you know things were different so this year they you go up you go up chocolate thunder for qualifying which chocolate thunder is far harder than what it used to be because some rocks have shifted and all that kind of stuff you go to, you go up you go over the top of the top of that little mountain you run across the top and then you drop back down the sand go through some rock area down there up over some the lasso sand hill and drop back down to where you started from that was your your lap time and 
But then in the race, you do it backwards. You come down it and then go up the other side. So it was all all fine and all cool. And I was like, man, that's that's kind of a disaster. But it worked out very well. Um, I At Cam Hammers, you have to pay for qualifying. Or you're just at the back of the people that didn't qualify and they ran them draw. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm, I'm always going to at least pay and try to qualify because – you're going to beat people that break or you're going to people that roll. So you, you've got a little bit better chance, even if you're not crazy, crazy fast, like, you know, the, the other guys, you're going to beat somebody. Well, I was lead qualifier for, well, probably about the first <laughs> half hour <laughs> because I was the first person to qualify. So <laughs> we'll, we'll put that you on your resume for the next application. It's just at the very top first bullet point. Top qualifier for five minutes. <laughs> Top qualifier. Um, sec- got second place at King Lammers, stuff like that. So you can definitely blow those little details in there to really build yourself up. But uh, I'm probably a little bit too honest. So I'm like, yeah, I got, I got second in, in the sportsman's class, and I finished about 33rd overall. So that's just truly what it was. As far as qualifying, I think I qualified like – I want to say I probably qualified like – 78 or something like that out of 118 entries so that's that's not great but it's in front of a lot of people that had an issue or might not be as fast or whatever and i was like all right that's cool well i go to check the qualifying thing i was the only sportsman qualified they decided to group all the sportsman's people together so we started at the back of the group so I went from like 78 to 102 off the line. And I was like, well, I still got to reach out to Dave Cole because that really doesn't sound too fair to me. Um, if I paid to qualify and my qualifying didn't even matter, I wouldn't have qualified. I wouldn't even paid for it. Um, and that's not calling nobody out. That's just kind of how it worked. And it's all fine. But like at the same time, I'm like, oh, that, that kind of sucks because that would have put me way ahead of my whole class and maybe I would have got first. Uh, <laughs> If, if we're going to go towards technicalities on this, that's maybe the way to go. Well, and just to save the, have, the beat down on the car, right? Like why, why risk the, the car and the maintenance and everything if it's not going to make any difference? Yeah, a hundred percent. Because a lot of people do tear their car up in qualifying, trying to be a fast lap. And I mean, that's what they need to do. But then you got to go rebuild it. Well, if I didn't have to touch it, you know, that, that's saving time and saving money, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, it's a small technicality. I had a great time. We had a, had a, a solid finish, uh, had a great co-driver, uh, great family and friends all support it, great companies, great people. So I really can't complain. It, it's always an amazing time out there. I think I enjoy the pre-running and the watching uh, more than the racing. Uh, the racing, like I say, the racing is fun until something goes bad, and then it, it, it basically sucks. You're like, well, I didn't, didn't hope and sign up for this, but – you know, it, it's all a technicality. Uh, I, I kind of find it funny because I can be one of those people that just like, oh, yeah, I got first place in the Baja 1000. Well, what class were you racing? Because you didn't win it. <laughs> well, and that's one of the things right um, now that a lot of racers are being frustrated with is just the number of UTV classes that are, are popping up, right? And just how thinned out it's getting. Uh, everybody's getting a gold star at the end of the day, it seems like. And um, and then you have a, a, this new open class for the four cylinders and things like that, where uh, it be, kind of comes an open open check to as much as you want to spend money, you can go race. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Are you on the same kind of thought wave of, uh, we need to clean these classes up and make it more competitive or, or do you appreciate the opportunity to have that smaller sportsman class or is it a mixture of those two ideas? Honestly, I I think it's a a mixture because I kind of, like I said, like you, you see people, you know, and it, it's all fine. Like it's all what you want to, I'm probably a little bit too honest uh, with myself, possibly coming from, well, number right here, the 199, if you're not winning, well, you, you just didn't win. That's all there is to it. Um, you know, I think it's good to have like a sports and stock class. It's people like me, trail riders, to get out there and to get a chance and, and try it and see if that's really what you like doing. Um, yeah, there, I do see a, a need for splitting up classes as far as like machine capabilities. Um, but it can get split too much. Um, so, you know, 
like a pro class that should be kind of pro everything um as far as pro turbo pro na i don't know they both have their advantages um so you know i've seen people in a pro na car be faster than pro turbo cars um it some of that gets down to the driver and a so, lot of yeah, that I mean, comes Dilo, down to that. like the 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 na versus the turbo yeah, that's where that's where the overall podium comes in, right? Like, let them be separate. They have different strengths and weaknesses. Let them compete on a on an even playing field, and then compete for the overall. That's that's totally fine, and I think that's why we love seeing the overall title, and that's why we like seeing the qualifying and stuff like that because it does really show uh, showcase the driver and their skill set, and it does amplify. Uh, their program in a way that uh, they deserved at that point, no matter what car they were driving. Uh, but when it comes down to the trophy podium, you know, let them have their class and all that. Let's just not make like pro turbo point two and point six and point nine. Like it just, it seems like we're getting a little bit too carried away with the classifications. And I think we just need to clean it up a little bit. And, you know, I, I think it, I think it comes out of super competitive teams not winning and then saying, well, this technicality in their program separates us because we can't do that. So let's just make another class for that. And I think the, the event organizers would be well off to say, Hey, if your program can't do that, figure out how to do that and let's go race. Yeah. I, I, I fully agree with that. You know, possibly a, an overall standings and then, you know, kind of a class, you know, differing the class and all that kind of stuff, you know, kind of selecting classes, I think. But yes, there can be too many classes. Um, I mean, I kind of relate everything back to motocross because that's what I kind of grew up racing when I could afford to go race it. And you have A, which is pro, then B and C and beginner. And then you have 250 and 450 and that's it. Uh, and then you have your age classes, you know, you got plus 30, plus 25, plus 40. Sometimes they'll have an A, B, and C, but they, they truly go off of skill set and bike size. And that's really all there is to it. Um, I don't, I know the UTV space, it, it's not really quite that easy, but in general, they are all the same motor size minus the one machine. At the same time, like, you know, more power for that company making that, that machine and all that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, you have, you know, they, they've had to put that machine in a different class. Uh, is that machine faster than the Can-Ams and stuff like that? Well, not necessarily. Um, I, I've kind of been around them, and I've been around numerous different machines, and you, know, you can take an X3 and pretty much wax anything out there if you're a good driver and you've got it built well. It's like um, what I, so I talk every, about, like, on the trail ride. Like, you can have a 200-horsepower can am versus a hundred horsepower, you know, Razor XP, it, you, you're still going to go around the corner at the same speed because if you don't, you're going to go off the end, right? Like you, you can only go as fast as your trail or your track is going to allow. The difference would be, you know, in the open stretches where you're doing salt flats or you're doing something like that. Um, and then how is how the suspension technology has changed in how it handles whoops and things like that. So those open stretches are what actually are the only opportunity for those cars to really perform differently. Um, and so that's why I think the, I think that there's definitely the opportunity to make a class for a four cylinder or for an open class that says unlimited, whatever you want to do type deal. Um, but at the same time, the truck guys are saying, Hey, you're, you're getting too close to our territory. And so why is there this other class that does the same thing that we do? Um, and it really comes down to, I think, weight and structural and safety, um, in that, in that arena. But I think that, you know, there's in the UTV space, it, it definitely used to be super well-defined and it's getting a little bit blurry at the top edges and they need to really, I think that for the health of the racing scene, they need to clarify that a little bit, put some hard edges on it and, and say, these are the boundaries that we're going to be operating in. Yeah, it, you're hundred percent correct. It needs to be cleaned up and, you know, at the end of the day, not everybody gets a trophy. Like not everybody needs a trophy. Like those that truly earn it, you know, they earned it. Those that want it, well, you just need to work that little bit harder. <laughs> you, you keep wanting it. You keep working towards it. <laughs> I, I know it's, it's 
it's costly and and well at the end of the day like that's it's just what it is you know you you just need to determine how important certain things are and, and go towards them uh whether they're important or whether they're not important or whatever so you know i i I don't know. You're, I think you're right, and I think that's a, a good a good way to say it. What they're actually going to do with it, who knows? Like I, I don't race enough for it really to even matter. I race purely for the fun and purely to show that like kind of an average mechanical person can go out there and be semi competitive. Um, you know, that's why I like like racing, and I I love racing, and I I love I love adventure riding. I love trails and riding the mountains. I love that stuff probably more than anything, and I love you know, sharing the story with people and showing what's truly possible. And also, you know, with the how to stuff, you know, I truly love that kind of stuff. I love helping people and showing like, you know, this is all possible and this is how you do this. And this is the way that I did it. And hopefully that'll help you do something fun yourself. Speaking of, of helping people and showing people, uh, around that time, uh, there was the announcement that Can-Am was going to be starting to back this whole um, ride, sa- ride safe idea that you've been proponent of for the last year or two. Um, I think it's been a couple of years now. Um, can you explain a little bit about the Ride Safe Foundation and what you're doing there? Yeah, so I, like, I am a co-founder to Ride Safe Foundation along with a lady named Kristen Ulmer. Uh, she's helped me with these events and partnerships and trail ride events, she's helped me with a, a large scale of things um, for many years now. This, so we're officially a registered nonprofit as far as earlier this year. Uh, I want to say it was January or something like that. But we've been aiming towards this for the past probably three to four years. Uh, in in short, the way this all came about is, you know, she's done sports marketing like and power sports marketing and race car marketing for years and years and years and has tons of information tons of contacts and just trying to kind of get a handle on this utv space and kind of see what's going where and all that kind of stuff uh, as far as numbers and percentages and where sales are going and why they're going there or whatever she had a a, a nephew pass away at 11 years old um and it was due to an ATV accident and it was due to not wearing a helmet. Um, so she's trying to pull all this data and stuff like this and just find information about this UTV space. And she was scrolling through a website and randomly found a bunch of press releases about kind of ATV, UTV, dirt bike area, power sports, basically in general. And she randomly scrolled down through the page and randomly just clicked a press release and read it. And it, was talking about this upcoming Memorial Day weekend, how, you know, this is a, a very common weekend for injuries within power sports. Here is a checklist of things to check over to make sure you're aware of to be safer and have a good time at the same time. And so she read through all this in this checklist and her little nephew had basically missed like half of these bullet points. And so she's, she's kind of getting emotional and thinking about it like, Okay, so if Logan would have known these things, he could possibly still be here. Um, so she scrolled down to the bottom, and it was put out by Rova, which is Recreational Off-Highway Vehicle Association. And in short, Rova is a safety-oriented entity, uh, kind of all put together by numerous companies to help keep power source people safe and aware of what's going on. And so she's like, why didn't he get this and all this kind of stuff? And she looked at the print date. The print date was the day before he passed away, like the exact day, day, year, and everything. So that kind of all of a sudden hit the brakes, stop. Who are these people? Why is this out here? Why didn't the public see this? Why, why, why? Got a hold of people at Rova and HB Safety Institute, numerous other people, and started asking all these questions and just trying to get some information and some answers. And uh, within the industries itself and i'm i don't consider myself in the industry but i guess i kind of am for being an influencer and whatever uh and being part of companies um within the industry some of these messages may float around but they don't reach the people that they need to reach um so she's like this is something that we need to look into we need to make a difference we need to help because we lost someone and with these proper steps we may not have lost them and not trying to go too dark or not like that. Yeah, that's just the real and honest truth about it. 
So she decided, and I was like, yeah, I'm on board, whatever you need, you know, or let's work together. Let's make it happen. Myself being part of Travis Pastrana and Nitro Circus and all that kind of stuff. We're probably the, one of the most well-known action sports, extreme sports names on the planet and largely for doing some of the most extreme stunts and extreme video production you know things in the world but we've not we've always been really safe about it we'll just keep it like that because you can't do these stunts and this racing and stuff over and over and over without being kind of safe about it being having the right precautions all that kind of stuff you know going out here and and travis shooting for a triple backflip which coincidentally took three years to do. And then he kind of passed it on and Josh Sheehan did it and all that kind of stuff. That wasn't just an accident. It happened. And it wasn't just randomly set up a ramp and wing it and see what happens. There is a certain point to that, but very, very, very slim. It's, it's proper setup and proper precautions to keep you as safe as possible. That way you can get up and try it again. Well, we're kind of taking that same mindset and entering it towards this Ride Safe Foundation of, you know, if you love riding and all that kind of stuff, that's amazing. We want everybody to get out there and ride, whether you're riding a bicycle, an ATV, UTV, a horse, it doesn't matter. Go out there and ride and have fun. But if you'll if you'll take these proper precautions, they're going to keep you safe and they're going to help you in that whole just-in-case scenario. Because we don't all have ambulances and doctors and medics sitting there waiting just in case something happened. Like when we film and stuff like that, we have EMTs and everything sitting there just in case. Uh, well, you don't have that when you're out trail riding. Uh, kids don't have that when they're out riding their go-karts, dirt bikes, whatever, out in the field. Um, you, you don't have those scenarios. So if you take these proper precautions of, you know, the right gear, knowing how to operate your machine correctly, getting safety certified for your machine, um, you know, all these like little steps, they're, they're small steps, but all these small steps keep you safe for that kind of what if just in case scenario uh that's that's really what we're doing as far as rod safe we're just we're encouraging those proper things and, and helping channel people to the right areas so like all right here's where you go for safety certification here's where you go for helmets here's where you go to get you know your helmet fitted you know you know trying to connect the dots for people so we partner with uh brp uh basically early early this year and you know brp is the parent of can -Am bombardier recreational products so brp i you know we i work with can am and then we work with brp on that end of it brp has a responsible rider program and they decided to work with us ride safe foundation and they decided to work with tread lightly and tread lightly is you know land stewardship and stuff like that and they're all about safety also but we're kind of strictly about safety i mean we're all about being proper stewards but we're more on the safety side tread lightly is the more of keeping the lands open side but you know we all work together to to make these great programs and and just help reach people and you know help them be prepared for when they encounter a power sports vehicle because you know you're all going to encounter one at some given time if you have the right tools in your backpack for when you encounter it odds are it's going to be a really good really good fun time right and then there's it goes back to that conversation about the more you prep, the more you're prepared to handle the situation, the more you think about something, the more you're aware of it when it happens. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've told somebody, you know, when they buy a new UTV for the first time, go in slowly to your off-road park or whatever. Just go in slowly. Just enjoy the first day. The second day, maybe get a little more speed. The third day, start to corner and, and try to figure out what your car is capable of. Make adjustments on the shocks if you have to. Like, start to feel out and learn your vehicle because there's so much to know about it, let alone just how it's going to handle in a situation. Um, just like dune riding, right? You go to the dunes, go with somebody that knows ex the experience of the dunes and can tell you what to look for in a witch's eye or in a, um, you know, a drop off or, or how to handle a transition, things like that, where, um, you know, our sport is very, very much open to anybody, but everybody should have some sort of conversation before getting in. They should have some sort of idea of how their car is going to handle in certain certain situations, what it's good at, what it's not good at. Um, and I think that should be part of the sales process almost where it's like, okay, we've gone past the salesman pitch side. Now you're going to be purchasing. Let's talk a little bit about what you're going to be doing and make sure that you're 
um, going to be the best prepared for what you want to do um, and be kind of like that transition, that handoff to like, here's a group of people you can go ride with for the first time. Here's a, you know, um, a, a good resource online for you to understand safety and what it means to, you know, what's possible if you let hang your arm out the window, like what's, what's going to happen if you, you know, encounter an animal or whatever on the trail, or if you get hurt, what are some of the medical things you'll need to be aware of? Like, there's this conversation that isn't really part of the acquisition process that I think that if more people did that at the time of acquisition or at the, at the time of, of engaging with the sport, um, you know, our industry would be well, um, would be, so we would have a lot less news stories about someone's hand getting crushed or their arm being amputated or being ejected out of the vehicle on a nosedive or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and so the more exposure we can bring to that, um, and then the tread lightly thing is, is definitely just like a shoe into that. Like, it's just all part of the same conversation, you know, being good stewards and, and respecting the land, the land you're on and the trails you're on and, and leaving it good for the next person and, and making things better than we, the way you found them. Like there's all these conversations to be had, but on the face of it, it looks like work, right? And it looks like this thing that is an obligation that I have to do and blah, blah. So a lot of people just skip it. Right. And I think it's super important that we, we put a, a good fresh spin on it that we say, Hey, this is not, this isn't, this isn't a burden on you. This is actually just going to help you enjoy what you're wanting to do more. Oh, 100%. Um, we looked into some data. It was a couple years ago and it may very well still be true. Um, so, Rova and HB Safety Institute, they offer like rider safety safety training for new vehicle buyers. Uh, normally, that's a cost of I don't remember how much it was for the little course or whatever. You can do an online course, um, but at one time, and it may still be true now, I, I couldn't guarantee it. With the purchase of every new machine. There was an automatic credit to go get that course at no cost um and i'd have to verify that for sure but like programs like that like that's what we're trying to put programs together like that better um that way any kind of sales can result back to pushing per the person towards understanding your machine better and if you understand your machine better and you're more comfortable with your machine not only are you less likely to get injured but you're more likely to have more fun because you know its capabilities much sooner than learning kind of the hard way like many of us did like i learned the hard way as a kid okay well you don't turn a four-wheeler that fast or it will flip over on you and it'll run over your leg and you're going to be hurting for a few days um and trial and error is the way many of us learn but uh, it would be nice for people to not have to go through that that pain and agony of like oh crap i've I just ran myself over, you know, and get really gun shy of it. You know, you need to respect the machines, no doubt. I think, but I think it would be super cool to just have like, uh, uh, like a, a razor or something or, a, or, or a commander or something that's top heavy that had no skins on it, had no nothing, had windows nets, had everything, safety straps, everything. And then just like the first thing you do is like, okay, go roll that. And then experience what that feels like. I think that should be part of the like the training requirements for buying a UTV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a bad idea if you could set one up with the with the right bars and the right safety aspects and keep yourself in it and say, all right, now go hit that turn as fast as you think you can. Okay, so now you see that you can't go that fast. <laughs> with the, <laughs> that would be. A good, I don't know if we could really do that and I'm not really going to encourage that, but <laughs> well, you know, those like, uh, you've seen like on, on the reality shows or whatever, they make the cars with the roll bars over the top so they can slam the brakes on and like roll them over. I think we just build a sphere with a UTV under it. And then we just say, go at it. And just you, you tell me how fast you're going to go. And then <laughs> let's just find out how, it, how it works. That's, that's not a hard thing to do. I've, I've got the right <laughs> people around. I know somebody that knows how to weld and build a build a safe area in the dirt. Maybe we can make something happen. <laughs> that, that that might actually be pretty funny. <laughs> so, uh, with a partnership with BRP and and kind of the relationships with these various programs, um, are you guys doing anything this year that people can participate with? 
Um, so yes, we're we're currently building a lot of things. So we've got a website under under construction right now. It it's up. Uh, the website is going to be the main portal as far as sending people there so they can find information they're looking for, or we can help them find the information. Uh, I'm going to be shooting numerous safety oriented videos. I'm part of the safety videos for Can Am themselves, like the corporate safety videos. Um, my my buddies that are um, Uncharted Society Outfitters, they show my videos or the videos I'm part of to every new person renting a Can-Am. He said, so we hear your voice every single day. Uh, and that comes from the corporate side of the legalities and all that kind of stuff with Can-Am and trying to show, you know, fun times and machines, but also the safe processes of using those machines. Um, so in, in short, ridesafefoundation.org is our site. Uh, it's under construction. It's, it's growing basically daily, uh, collecting lots of information, stuff like that. This, one of our main goals is, um, presentations at schools with kids. Uh, the largest school I've done to date is a thousand kids. So we, we went up in the Wisconsin area and did a presentation of middle and high school and elementary school all at one school. Had a thousand kids in there, do a presentation, show some machines, show some video clips, and just have people like myself, um, local law enforcement, DNR, stuff like that, get up there and talk about the reasons why it's important to go keep these safety, these safety areas in your head, you know, be aware of all your surroundings, be aware of the safety. Um, so we have events planned for this fall. Um, Kristen, which is our executive director of the nonprofit, she has many, many good connections in, in the northern area of Wisconsin and Arizona and kind of all over the country. And unfortunately, it's good, but unfortunately, like once this, it seems that once this takes traction, um, it's going to be an animal to try to maintain. Uh, just her meetings up in Wisconsin, and I, we, we aim the Wisconsin area, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan area, uh, and many people may not know this. People from that area would know this. So there's more trail miles in Wisconsin and Upper Michigan than there are tr than there are interstate miles in the whole country. Um, that's how prevalent trails are up there. Much of it comes from snow and sleds because um, snow and sleds and stuff like that. That it's almost transportation during the winter time. Not all the trails are open during the summer for off road and OHV UTV stuff like that. But a large portion of them are. So, like, as far as, like, registered power sports, you know, members of clubs and all that kind of stuff, it's like, I want to say it's number two or three or it, it's top three in the whole country is up in that area right there. Well, I mean, that whole area is what started snowmobiles. It's what started off-road vehicles. It's what started this whole thing. Like, it, everything's born out of that little area of the country. Um, and you know, I've, I've been up there, my extended family's from up there. Like it, it's, it's part of the culture up there that it, everybody has a quad or, or a snowmobile or a, or an UTV or something, because it is just like in my area, we call snowmobiling the rich man sport because it's a very high dollar equipment purchase with a very short window. But up there it's not, it's like, Everybody does it. Everybody has one. It's at least half the year's worth of of doing things related to that uh, to that vehicle, um, and so I I can only imagine that uh, there's probably a very very high sit saturation of people up there that actually ride on a on either a daily or multi day during the week basis. Yes, very much so. And, you know, I not being from that area, not really being from the snow realm, um, I wasn't really aware of that until Kristen introduced it to me because she's originally from up there. Uh, she lives in the Phoenix area and she's spending the summer up there making connections, all that kind of stuff. We have a lot of support because we've already been up there and, and done presentation type events. We have a lot of support from like state, county, you know, town levels, schools, DNR, police. Everyone's about it. Uh, and they're all about it because there are those stories that pop up in the news of people being injured and stuff like that on their power sports vehicles. And um, they're just wanting to make a difference. Um, 
And the one so thing she, that a county and a city don't appreciate is having those stories on the news multiple times during the week, right? Like they want their city, their county to be a safe, welcoming, tourist friendly, like everybody's all about not having negative stories in the press. And so if you are seeing an influx of that, they're going to be willing to support the initiative at a very high level. Oh, oh very much so. Um, so we we're going to be at the Heydays events, uh, which is in Minnesota. I want to say it's an hour north of um, the Twin Cities area, whatever. I can't even remember where. And it is. FYI, it's primarily a snowmobile show, but it has if you if you enjoy people watching, it's one of the most entertaining places to go. And then the the swap meet that is the other half of the show, like after like six p.m. after everybody's had dinner and, and is just starting to clear the cooler out, like it gets really interesting really fast. Yes, heydays is is an amazing event. In short, it's a very very like you say, it's a very big swap meet, you know, basically a a yard sale or whatever. So, you know, people have their little camps and they're selling everything you could possibly think of as far as snow goes. But there is a lot of ATV, UTV stuff in that area. Uh, they have their grass drags, which is basically a snowmobile on a slick track and they drag race through the grass. Very, watched- very, very fast, by the way. Like if you've never seen these snowmobiles, these things are hot rodded beyond insanity and they're going so stinking fast. It's unbelievable anybody does it. Yes, I I, I have been years and I never actually went over and watched the grass tracks because I was either part of Terra Cross or helping with the freestyle show, building the course and stuff like that. I went over there and watched the grass tracks and you've got these sleds that are pushing three to 500 horsepower. Unreal how fast they are and just, and they're gone. And I'm like, holy cow. But this is a very, very large event for, for off-road in general whether it be snow or dirt or whatever and all the oems will be set up there because that's in september so that's basically when they've pre-launch their new stuff for the next year or they're launching it there and they're starting to deliver snow check they're starting to deliver in on a lot of these announcements throughout the year at that time um and they used to actually have side-by-side racing there uh and then they stopped doing that uh it'd be interesting to see them bring that back i think that was a that was a really cool thing that they did Yes, it, it was a very good showing. It was Terra Cross. That was a, it was a lot of fun. That that whole racing aspect was basically uh, much like our pit bike races for Nitro Circus. Everyone's racing the same machine, um, so companies basically step up and put their logos on it, and they race. And you know, basically a um, a stock car class. You're running all the exact same stuff, and whoever's the best driver and doesn't tear up their stuff wins. So, but yeah, we'll be at Heydays. Um, you know, promoting the ride safe foundation with brp and then that that following week we have numerous stop locations in planning for presentations at schools and stuff like that i i'm getting numbers back of like they're going to bus kids to a bigger location so we can reach more people at one time um it's pretty amazing i mean feet on the ground people are are all about it uh really just making making a difference uh in short the way that that I look at it in the way the, the simply way I, I put it like racers and stuff like that, all that gear is required. So racing dirt bikes and stuff like that and growing up, you, you naturally wear that stuff because that's just how you grow up and they require it to even get on the track. Uh, the UTV space, there's a, there's a, a little bit of false mindset on it because people drive cars every day. So they get in and they treat it like a car. So you got a seat belt and you're not going to hit, you directly won't necessarily hit the ground like a dirt bike. So you instantly feel safe and you don't need a helmet, but that doesn't really matter because if you roll over, your head can hit the roll cage or it can hit the ground or something can fall inside and hit you. Um, you know, a, a broken arm or a broken leg. I mean, that sucks, but it's a broken bone. It'll heal for the most part. Uh, pretty high odds of it healing back just fine, but knocking you in the head, um, things can happen that, you know, can really, really really hurt you for the rest of your life so you know keep your head safe you know as far as eyes eye protection and helmets and stuff like that that's that's the biggest thing is you know keep those things in mind because i can ask a whole school full of kids you know how many of you have uh, atv utv dirt bikes so like that or have one in the family it probably it depends on where you go but it's probably about 30 to 40 percent of the kids will raise their hand and 
then I say, okay, so how many of you know someone that has one of these? Well, that's basically everybody else. So it's just preparing these young kids and, and family members and parents, whatever, preparing them for that time when they are going to encounter that machine and just knowing, okay, I learned about this at this little presentation that like, I need to have a helmet before I'm going to get on that. And I need to be this age. And I need to just be aware of these things. You know, that's the biggest thing is awareness for whenever you are encountering that machine. And I think the, the OEMs are definitely taking notice of this whole concept, right? Like they're starting to introduce harnesses into more of their vehicles and, and not just three points and, um, you know, doing things like the retractable harnesses. So it's, it's more of a comfort thing versus a, a, a an annoyance um, and, and various different aspects. And, and I really liked that, um, like the Honda Talon comes with window nets. Um, and I think that a lot of OEMs would be well off to maybe consider that option. One of the most common injuries with off-road UTV access is arm injuries and hand injuries, uh, because they go flying out the window. Um, and then, like you said, you know, if you do encounter a rollover or like very common where I'm at, where tree branches come in the cab, you know, and while the cage does deflect the branch, it does come back and whip you in the face a lot of the times. And, and all of a sudden the driver's trying to pull a, a twig out of his eye socket. Like, it's just, um, I think it'd be really cool to see more of this integration into the OEM process. Like I said earlier, the sales process, the acquisition process. Um, and you know, we, I took my family out for a little stay at the dunes last year and, um, you know, we went and rented some quads. Like uh, the kids had never been on quads. They never been on the dunes. So like me being experienced, I could, I could take them for that experience and teach them a few things and then just kind of let them go and watch them and oversee them. Right. Like, and we still had to go through the safety course. Like when we rented those cars, right. So everybody's annoyed that they have to stand around for 15 minutes and watch this dumb little video that looks like it was made in the eighties. Like it's just this process that we all feel it's just instantly. We just ugh, like we, we tense up when we have to do it. But if we approach it from new angles in a new way with people that are interesting and topics that are interesting, we can make this a normal thing and not make it such a burden on our, on our, on our industry. Um, and if we start at the very beginning and don't wait till something bad happens, um, I think that there's going to be a lot less news in the, a lot less stories in the news. Um, and I'm excited to see that the OEMs are bringing you guys on board and, and really supporting it. And the counties are really supporting it. Um, and that we can actually reach more people. Uh, I think that we need more of that specialized niche training in different regions of the country as well. So like Michigan education should be very focused, uh, on that style of writing. And, and, and if you go over to Glamis, like it should be very focused on the desert version of that. And, you know, and, and in, in these little parks down in the Southeast where you guys are getting really rocky and really vertical and, and all these different things. Like there's a lot of overlap in safety, but there's also a lot of specific information, uh, that could really benefit those communities and those riding groups. Um, and then just bringing along those, you know, stewardship ideas along with it, right? Like making it very inclusive to the support. Let's, let's clean up. I have a, a friend, uh, uh, down doing, uh, cleanup in the dunes right now. And he made a custom magnet for the front of his razor and, um, and all that dirt life media, go check them out. Um, he's, he's on a mission to do, to do better. Right. And to, to make up for everybody's wrongdoings out in the dunes. And so he's really making an impact and starting to get some traction there. And I think more people should take, take on that mission statement of let's make the world better, not just like the world in general, but like our, our community, our community is so uh, specific to the connection we have with each other and the land. Um, and we need more people to, to address these upfront issues so that we don't have to recover from them. And the, like the oceanic dunes and all those different groups that are, are fighting to regain their land. Um, we should never get to that point. We should, we should be proactive in this. I think safety is, is super important. I think land cleanup, super important, but just being more vocal, more opportunities to be vocal about, being proactive in our community is super important. And I hope that, you know, anyone that runs an event, anyone that organizes um, communication systems to the community or, or branding, things like that, you, you take a second to consider the opportunity to invest in that because I think that overall, it's ultimately going to keep our, our industry healthier longer than letting it 
erode over time and be something that it becomes such a niche sport that it, it niches itself out of the populace. Oh, 100%. And, um, you know, on the, on the stewardship side of it, you know, tread lightly does an awesome job. And I know those people over there and, and on the, on the cross country ride from border to border, we actually stopped in the, um, Sedona Cottonwood area, lots of amazing riding there. And, um, the Sedona area, they, they've caught a lot of flack because there's lots of rental companies and they're renting, to, renting machines to people that don't do this. So I'm not saying that's good or bad, but the rental people don't necessarily look at it the same way of that us that really truly love this in a hobby. And so we went out with tread lightly people to do trail cleanup on a trail and do some trail marking and stuff like that, because the trail is, has gotten a little bit out of hand. Like it, it had ventured off way off the path of where it was supposed to be and stuff like that. So we spent, we spent probably six hours out there, uh, cleaning up the trail, marking the trail better with signage and kind of redirecting the trail where it needs to be. And that was my whole crew for the cross country thing. Camera guys, the power plus guys, my mom, uh, everybody came to me later on. They said, your mom straight is like, <laughs> she works like a, works like a mule out there. Like she don't stop. She had blood on her legs, like some stickers had scraped her up and she's just trucking right along and dragging sticks and tree limbs and whatever else. And we need um, a, uh, support mother goose shirt. We need to make that happen. <laughs> but you know, she, I mean, and we were all just super happy to be part of it. Um, and, and try to make a difference. And, you know, we did a little bit of video around it and stuff like that, just to show how important this stuff really is. Uh, there's a meme floating around and I read it once and it fully made sense. And it said a, a successful person has, doesn't leave their shopping cart just in the middle of the parking lot. They always put it back to where it came from. If you're, if you're too big for that, then, then you're, I, I don't remember the exact meaning of wording of it, but it's kind of the same thing. Like if you, if, you're going to be a, a rider and stuff like that and enjoy and use the outdoors, you know, treat them with care because riding outdoors, riding trails, it's a privilege. It's, it's not a, I don't even remember how you say it. Yeah. It's not an, it's not a, a human right that we have the opportunity to go tear up the mountains with a UTV, right? Like it's, it, it is solely dependent on the emotional reaction of our, 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 Polit political system to to allow this to maintain or to shut it down like there's no there is no like hey the political system's going to say we're going to open up this new mountain range to you guys to go ride it's it's never going to be that it's always going to be you have this thing it's whether or not we're going to shut you down or not and so we need to give them all the reasons in the world to not even know we exist <laughs> for the most part to say, you know, because as soon as we become a talking point, we become something to be shut down. So the only way that we can maintain what we have is to maintain a proactive, positive influence in each of one of our individual areas so that if if it does become a talking point at any given point in time, like all it takes is one incident, one fire, one accident, one garbage dump, one whatever that you know, can become a talking point at a city council meeting, like out in Moab. It could be one talking point up at the state level about pollution. It could be, you know, something in California where they're saying exhaust emissions. You know, it could be any one of these s silly little things that can become a talking point. But if that talking point comes up and then it's backed by years of stewardship and responsibility, you know, there's no reason for them to shut it down and continue the talking point. If it continues more than one breath of sentence, that's when we have to be concerned and we should never let our guard down because as soon as it does, the, the percentage of success starts to quickly degrade and become more of an, uh, uh, uh something that we're going to lose. Uh, 100%, you know, riding, riding public lands, riding in general, it's, you're right. It, it's a privilege. It's not a right. So, uh, I think everyone just needs to really remember that. And then just, you know, be knowledgeable and be safe about it and, and just go out and have a good time. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of a good time, uh, you've been out 
doing something that you love almost as much as writing, and that's playing in the dirt uh, down at the uh, Mid America Park, uh, building a new Nitro Cross uh, course and, and various other things. Um, and I don't want to extend this episode out way too long. It already is super long, but uh, just give us a real quick rundown of what you've been doing out there with Travis and what you guys' vision is, and um, you know maybe what we can look forward to. Uh, yeah. So in in short, you know, as I said earlier, Travis Travis loves racing loves rally cars loves the rally rally cross scene uh because it's fast short exciting racing um so he had a, a concept track we were going to build it here in maryland uh they were committed to some land but it, it just didn't work out like the town and the county was all about it and they wanted it because it brings some money into their area but there was a conservation group with a pe- bunch of people with money and they just they fought it and they fought it and fought it and fought it and they didn't really um they just didn't want it. They just didn't want growth out there, which for some reason, I don't know why. Um, but I get it at the same time. You know, you, you, I live on a lot of land and I hate seeing land being chopped up. So I see both sides of it. But at the end of the day, it just didn't work out over there. Uh, it was just going to be too costly. So it was like, all right, well, let's just continue to grow the Rally Cross Series. Terry Madden introduced Travis to Jason, the owner of Mid-America, and came to him with all these ideas. And Jason's like, yeah, I, I definitely see some value in that. I see that's awesome. Uh, that can bring on some really good um, video aspects and TV and all that kind of stuff. And Nitro already has that kind of pull. So he's like, yeah, you know, we'll build it for you. And Travis like, all right, well, I want I want Hubert here to be part of it because he, I, being around Travis almost 20 years, he can tell me what he wants, put it on a napkin, and I, and I have enough understanding of his talking points to put it on the ground and actually make it real and then from there you know they can go racing on it so we've been working on the rally cross track for shoot i don't know it's been two and a half months now uh moving astronomical amounts of dirt you know and they've got great valleys like you said great valleys and hillsides and stuff like that the place used to actually be a lake um what we're going to call the finish line now used to be a dam across the whole valley and it was a lake but it never held water great due to underground springs and all that kind of stuff. So they just started making a racetrack out of it and having a good time. So they've grown it into what it is now. So Nitro Rally Cross has been rebranded, renamed Nitro Cross. So we're building a Nitro Cross track. They'll have over and under jumps. You know, some of the bigger, biggest berms or hillsides that have ever been on a race track for those kind of cars. I'm sure numerous other vehicles will race on it, whether it's side-by-sides, trucks, ultra four. Um, I'm not sure the whole planning of it. I'm, my goal is goal and job is only to just help get the track that Travis wants built. Uh, we've got guys out there that have, um, myself being a part of it. Uh, we've built a new pit bike track up there. Visions has pit bike racing. They have all kinds of racing. So I think they're racing the pit bike track this weekend. That is the public version of it. Uh, we're adding a nitro circus, basically a couple lanes, a couple obstacles for nitro circus. We're going to do some, video stuff there during the visions event for the Nitro circus race um of course that that land is about 1500 acres they tell me there's lots of trails they're going to race ultra four there during visions um but then they also have a good connection with disney oklahoma which is a big off-road park area uh, owned by the state so there's going to be a lot of good riding there um so jason jason's an, an animal as far as businesses he's got the side-by-side racing he's got the ultra four He's got the Visions event. He's got American Pit Bike. Now he's doing American UTV Takeover or, or something of that nature. So I'm going to work with them on the takeover part of it because that's more of adventures and trail rides and stuff like that. I think it's, yeah, American sub side Takeover Series. Uh, so they had one over in Oklahoma, I think at the Sand Dunes. The next one will be at Visions uh, June 12th to the 17th time frame. And then the, the last of the American side side takeover will be at Lake Havasu uh, during the same time frame as the Ultra 4 race. Um, that Ultra 4 race, I believe, is the final round of the year. I'm not positive. Don't quote me on that. So, um, yeah, I've been a part of numerous things like that. Um, but basically living in a dozer, an excavator, a rock truck, whatever, uh, moving tons of dirt there at, at Mid-America. Just, just a quick a quick numbers for you. So I think the rally cross track is, it's, I think it's rolled out at a little over a mile, um, which is a rather long track because a lot of the rally cross tracks are built on a short course. 
Um, and they're running e cars. Uh, the the premier class is the electric cars, which are nasty, unreal. I saw, I finally saw one for the first day run the other day out there. They had one out there, and Travis was running it, just kind of testing some of the turns. And it literally like a, a full size RC car track. It, it winds just like that. Unreal how fast it is. And um, you know, they're building the rally cross track for all that kind of stuff, and we're building the track between 50 and 60 feet wide it's almost a mile long or, or pushing a little more than a mile long and i did the calculations because their dirt out there is not that great it's got a lot of rocks in it a lot of gravel you know rocks anywhere from little rocks to big rocks and we're having to run a screen so they're pulling dirt off the property screening it so we have good dirt to put on as the track surface uh, the track surface needs to be x amount of inches so thick for a nice barrier so the cars won't eat through it we have room to play with it pull it back repack it all that kind of stuff uh, I did the math, and we needed 150,000 yards of dirt to cover this track. Um, and just for fun's sake, one of our dump trucks, like what you saw in the video, holds 30 yards. So that's 5,000 dump truck loads of dirt. Uh, that's just <laughs> track surface. That's not like building the berms and like the base dirt that's needed. So that's... That's just the reality of the, the amount of dirt we've been moving to make an amazing facility. Now you you've you've shown in the past, you know, some partnerships with like Cat and stuff like that to to create content. And I saw that you were out in a dozer uh, that had like GPS markers on it and a whole bunch of the whole nine yards on it. Like, how how has it been coming from the old days where you were like trying to maintain a tractor to actually get the dirt moving, let alone into these multi million dollar tractors? Now what's What's that got to feel like when you're out there cutting new, new, uh, course? Well, so, so in typical Travis and Nitro Circus style, I mean, this is literally started on a napkin as a drawing and our, our good buddy, Nate is a ramp designer and he can run the cab programs and stuff like that. And he's drawing it out and laid this track over like satellite imagery of this land. So we know what's going where, um, measurements definitely vary. Uh, a lot of this is like, I can build it to what he says and build it very, very close. And then it gets into a feel thing. Like he'll go run on it and say, okay, that feels great, but let's change the angle here, here, and here to make it flow a little bit better. And let's change the inside of this turn to make the inside, not the fastest point. Uh, biggest thing is having, having good racing the whole time and having it fun for the drivers. Uh, they says, the drivers that have drove on so far, they said it's like a roller coaster. It's up and down and it flows. They said it's just amazing. Um, so, you know, going from, you know, doing a project with Caterpillar to where they basically, I drew a bunch of stuff, sent it to them. They laid it into GPS. They laid it into all the machines and all the machines have it. Um, and so you're always on the same page. It's super awesome, but it, it's incredibly expensive to do that because those kind of machines and that software and stuff like that, you know, the, that's a range of thirty to fifty thousand dollar upgrade per the machine, and we're just renting everything for there. So uh, this is more of old school, putting out flags, pulling measurements, stuff like that, and just you know we are using GPS as far as knowing elevations and knowing kind of help where the changes need to be and all that kind of stuff, uh, and help for drainage, all that kind of stuff. We're going to drain it correctly. The end goal is a good bit of pavement and concrete on this track with time. Uh, this is just stage one. It's mostly all dirt. Uh, they will con they will pave or concrete the starting grid for the cars, and then they'll roll on dirt. Eventually, there will be more of those materials out there. It just takes time. But, yeah, um, it doesn't matter. Like, we can run whatever you want to run, whether it's new stuff or old stuff. Newer stuff's a little bit more efficient, a little bit less in fuel. So uh, we definitely aim towards the newer stuff if possible. When do you guys uh, see the first actual event happening on the course and, and Nitro Cross actually happening? So the first Nitro Cross event is that Visions Week. Uh, I believe it's towards the end of the week. Um, it's June 12th to the 17th is the Visions event itself. There will be Nitro Cross racing there. There will be a Nitro Circus live show there. Uh, of course, there will be Ultra 4. There will be the side, side takeover there will be short course racing there will be a large range of things going on i don't know how they're going to get it all done but evidently they've i mean they've got a heck of a crew i've met most of the people there and everyone's amazing super nice uh they're all very good at their jobs um 
so yeah that'll be the first of nitro cross event nitro it used to be called nitro rally cross it has been renamed relabeled and stuff like that um dana white uh the, one of the main main people from starting ufc his company has stepped in to help the nitro circus and nitro cross stuff and really help it grow uh they just they have a very very good handle on entertainment and the proper ways to help it grow in the best ways um thrill one is the parent company and then you have nitro circus Nit nitro cross nitro live you know, numerous other things under throw one and dana white's company and i think juggernaut and whatever his team is they've they've came in and said all right we're going to help y'all grow this into an animal because nitro circus is already one of the biggest extreme sport kind of stunt show names in the world it we're going to help you get it even bigger so we've got amazing people that are all part of it to help grow this to an animal that uh, basically you can't put a leech or a collar on i've always uh i've always had this vision of like up here in the northwest we don't really get a ton of like big shows where i'm at um and so we don't have the facilities of like the big super big stadiums to do like a, a nitro cross or a nitro circus event we have to go to seattle or somewhere like that for it uh but i always thought it would be super entertaining to have like down at the state line speedways or the the little race courses or whatever they have these like these like halftime shows where side by sides are doing like rally cross on the race course and up and overs and and you know jumps and stuff like that i think it'd be super fun and i we need more of that in our culture we need more um thrills uh that is outside of a sport arena we need some more we need some more dirt and some more some more gas 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 in our face yeah well uh just keep putting the ideas out there and we'll we'll keep uh taking in the ideas and, and trying to grow it. Uh, this, this year, I want to say it's the end of this year, uh, into next year is 20 years of Nitro Circus. So uh, they're bringing the live shows back indoors. Um, I've been on some meetings on, you know, growing the Nitro live tour show uh, in, in numerous different ways and, and such as that. So it's going to be, uh, going to be a big, a big year for all this Nitro oriented stuff. So with all the things you're doing, <laughs> uh, I can imagine you're getting just an insane amount of sleep and rest and, uh, you're not jet lagged and you're, you're not, you know, overtaxed or anything. Is there anything that you have coming up that we can all check out and be excited for, um, that you're working towards? Um, I mean, basically anything I've been working on, if it goes out on social media, you know, it's there for people to see, uh, we are, I'm. I've got guys, um, editor guys helping doing a long version, maybe a two episode long version of my cross country trip. Cause we have, we have tons of footage that, you know, they only port highlights for nitro and can am and stuff like that. Um, that'll be on my YouTube channel with time. Of course, ride safe foundation. We'd love everybody to check that out. Just look into it. Uh, if you want to help be part of that kind of stuff, uh, we're always looking for help, whether it's people or partners or companies or, or whatever um we need lots of help for the actual events themselves uh ridesafefoundation.org there's uh i'm i haven't seen it because it's not all totally finished but there will be a, a link there that you can click and and email in uh your info and all that kind of stuff if you want to be a part of that of course i'm doing my redneck adventure series um i've already done a ride at brimstone and um royal blue i'm going to do work with this utv or utv takeover series uh, american side by side takeover work with those guys ride at their events you know help really try to spread the word of you know awesome riding um be at brimstone later in the year for their paragon event of course heydays all that kind of stuff yeah i mean it's, it's so i mean exhausting. we're not going to see you anywhere is what you're saying <laughs> i'll be at a lot of places um and they're kind of all over i mean if it's on my social media that's and i I try to put out a, a decent schedule of places where I'm going to be where people can come meet up, come ride. I'm probably going to do some things with Dustin Jones and do some things with Can Elm, I'm sure. I know you got a lot of things uh, coming up even just this week and then going into the next month. Um, and uh, super stoked for you to, to be out there just com completely just 
grinding hard to see things happen. Um, you know, the, the best tools get used every day. Right. So, um, that's, that's what I've been seeing and I'm super stoked for you. And like I said, it's been a long time since we've talked, especially here on the podcast. And, um, I'm super stoked for you. Start, I'm excited to see some of these fruits, uh, come to, to bear that we can start to see the, 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 the actual, maturation of all this stuff and, and where it's going. Um, so just real quick to close out the episode, where can we find you? Where can we see what you're doing and where can we follow you online to see the next things? So all of my social media oriented stuff is at nitro redneck, R E D N E K Hubert H U B E R T. That's Instagram and Facebook. That's all I mess with. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's, uh, redneck racing i believe it is it's got a lot of can am how-to parts as far as putting parts on um ride safe down ride safe foundation.org is all about the ride safe foundation what we're doing with power sports safety awareness and you know that that's most of it you know keep keep track of nitro circus uh, nitro circus.com i'm sure they're rebuilding the nitro cross page keep track of that if you want to see some amazing racing with amazing cars course keep in keep in touch with like mid america and ultra four and all that kind of stuff there's of course drive a can am use super atv parts fuel wheels efx tires you know pit viper keep your just keep your eyes in in check um you know just all the many many great <laughs> things, the things out there you got a lot of sponsors that have really helped you uh elevate the game and what you're doing out there and i'm super stoked for you um just uh, this this episode has gone way longer than we've gone in a long time. So I appreciate your time, Hubert. I appreciate your friendship. Uh, super stoked to see uh, everything come uh, to bear. And uh, if you're a fan of the podcast, give us a subscribe. You can follow us on iTunes, Google, uh, iHeartRadio, all Spotify, all the different places. If you think that Hubert's doing a great job, give us a, f- a five star review on I- iTunes. We'd appreciate it. Uh, you can find this episode and all of our episodes on our website, sidebysideguys.com. Uh, you can find links to all the topics that we've talked about along with bookmarks and all those different reference points of the episode there. Uh, and you can find it in your, uh, favorite podcatcher. So until the next time, guys, we appreciate your time. We appreciate you in the community doing a good job, cleaning your trails, keeping up your campsites, not burning pallets in the dunes and being a safe, capable driver on the trails. And until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.